world gone insane. An upside down civilization cannot be real. A world of madness and terror. It's the Dana Gould Hour. This episode of the Dana Gould Hour is brought to you by Harry's Shaving Kits. Please visit harrys.com and use promo code DANA for $5 off your first purchase. It's that time of year when the world falls in love. Not really, but it is the high dudgeon of the holiday season, and we have a stocking stuffed with awesomeness right here at the Dana Gould Hour. Today's show features smooth-skinned, doe-eyed Eddie Pepitone. He of the documentary The Bitter Buddha, which, if you haven't seen it, get it and stuff your eyes. Why not give it to yourself as a Christmas gift? Hey, speaking of Christmas, this Christmas Day sees the release of Tim Burton's new film Big Eyes, the stranger-than-fiction true story of Walter and Margaret Keane. The film was written and produced by Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, and Larry was kind enough to grace us with his presence today on the show. Along with Larry is one of my favorite people, who I actually met through him, comic artist Drew Friedman. Drew is famous to the readers of Raw Comics, The New Yorker, The New York Observer, Rolling Stone, Entertainment Weekly, The Late Lamented Spy Magazine. The list is endless. Drew has a new book out called Heroes of the Comics which features portraits and bios of the men behind the men behind the masks, the guys who actually thought up the heroes that you grew up reading about. The art is superlative. The stories are fascinating. Drew Friedman. And he's here on the show, and I'm so glad he made the time for us. Also, Denny Tedesco is here. Denny's documentary is called The Wrecking Crew, and it will be released in theaters this March. It's about the men and women behind the hits, most notably the hit songs that came out of Southern California in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Many of those songs were not performed on the records by the people in the band, but by a small group of heretofore unknown session musicians called the Wrecking Crew. The Beach Boys, the Monkees, the Mamas and the Papas, uh uh-uh, the Wrecking Crew. And carrying us over the finish line, speaking of music, the star of Jonah Radio, Jonah Ray is here. Now, all of this stuff, or certainly items that will deepen your knowledge of this stuff, is available from our good friends at Amazon.com. And the best way to get there, go to DanaGould.com. Click on our Amazon banner. You get what you want, and without paying a penny more, we here get a little something-something to keep the lights on. To pay the people who bring you the show, we use to tell you about the websites we use to help pay them. Huh? And before I get going, might I make one more holiday announcement? Looking for a gift for that special someone in your life who doesn't have enough t-shirts with stuff written on them? Why not toddle on down to ComedyFilmNerds.com and treat yourself to a three-color Dana Gould Hour t-shirt or a Bevilacqua Heating and Air Conditioning t-shirt. Frank Black has one. And now you can add a Dana Gould Hour beer koozie to your order for just a few bucks more. Going to the symphony, the ballet, sitting in in the gallery of the Supreme Court. Bring along a Dana Gould Hour beer koozie. Keep your beer cold while keeping your hands warm. Beer koozies. Science still doesn't know how they work. Science does know how they work. Or how about this? The Dana Gould Comedy CD 3-Pack. For the first time ever, all three of my CDs, Funhouse, Let Me Put My Thoughts in You, and I Know What's Wrong, are available from one place. ComedyFilmNerds.com Signed. Wasn't that a fun day? Where? ComedyFilmNerds.com And now, let's do this thing. Back from England and fully recovered, Edward Pepitone. Hello, Dana. Is it Edward or Edwin? 
Wow, I, I feel, I just feel angry that you said I could possibly be Edwin. Because oh, really? I feel like it's related to you. Because <laughs> I made it about me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's Edward. It's Edward. And I always loved Eddie. Like yeah. Eddie, I was an Eddie as yeah. a kid. I loved Eddie. Edward, that had undertones or overtones in my father's of an case. A, of an ascot. An ascot? An ascot. Yeah. yeah. And Edward, yeah. and Edward, Edwin, I can only think of Drood. Yeah. Edwin Drood. Who else is Edwin? That name has gone away. Adolf has gone away. Not as many also kids. Also, his named, hairstyle, yeah. Yeah, his hairstyle. Not as many kids named Killer. <laughs> I was telling you, you know, every time you take your dog to the vet, oh. they say, oh, they need teeth cleaning. And that is so true. Every time you take it to the vet. How much? Only $450. Oh, and I if w- you act now, and they're always telling me, they're giving me specials now I'm at the vet so much. I wish it was $450. Is yours more? So I took my two dogs to the vet to get their teeth cleaned. I give them the tooth cleany biscuits. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. I thought that was plenty. And now, granted, they do lick their own assholes. So <laughs> maybe there is some dental issues that I haven't fully thought out. But... My little dog, I went to pick him up. Yeah. Bill came to about three grand. Oh. A little under for two dogs. Well, that's because he had teeth right. pulled. The little dog had 12 teeth pulled. Now, he's a small dog. And I, I want to relate I, that. And I said that, like, when I dropped him off, I said, just, I always, just fix what needs to be right. fixed. Because they always call you up. Yeah, he has a giant tumor <laughs> on his eyeball. Do you want us to do anything? No, just leave it. Like, they always go. You know what I do? I yeah. always go, me and the vet always have this little dialogue. He goes, well, you can, you know, he gives me two options. I go, what would you do? And he goes, I would do this. I go, all right, let's do that. Like, yeah. I want the dog healthy. Yeah. And we found like, an easily yeah. removable but highly lethal tumor. <laughs> what do you want us to do? Can I call you back? I'm going to go into the garage and find that magic eight ball. <laughs> Fix a stupid thing. And the poor dog now, he's just like, I actually thought, my first thoughts was, oh, he's going to look different. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, he's going like to look a, like Gabby Hayes. Like drooling. Yeah, mush. Is he mush? Is he trying to my mush? But uh, he actually held on to his uh, his. He features. looks great. He looks great. But he's so small, my first reaction was, are there 12 teeth even in? That can be fit in his well, mouth. Yeah, so they're small. very tiny. His teeth tiny look teeth. like shattered Tic Tacs. <laughs> you know, they're, they're Jesus teeny. Jesus Christ. Is he a rescue dog also? Yeah, every, all my, yeah everything, okay, everything so I have. Everything is a in LA is rescue. Yeah, everything. Actresses. You could, sell, <laughs> you could sell necklaces if you just said it was a diamond rescue. People would suddenly come in and buy necklaces. <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> Yes. You know, people just want to feel good oh about themselves. Oh, my God, look at this neck. It doesn't have a home, Harold. Yeah, exactly. Could you rescue this Lexus SUV? Honey, is that an actress who, it doesn't look like that actress has a part. Should we just <laughs> Should put we her just in the car her? and bring her to a, a diner? That is a weird story that actually. True? Yeah, somewhat. My manager was telling me he had a meeting with a guy who was in, quote, the lifestyle, quote, Okay. This is one of my favorite stories, which is he's a swinger. A swinger. A swinger. Okay. Yeah. You've already got me. Yeah, you're like, in. I'm so attentive right you're now. In. Usually in this podcast, I drift in and out. Sure, you're going to But I am very. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm so, riveted. So as he was talking to Is it to Bob guy, Mitchum? I just want to start guessing. <laughs> Night Hunter? It, yeah. uh, uh, it, was of all, it was of all people, Alan Seuss. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but. The guy that hosts Cosmos. He's a big swinger. <laughs> I hear he is, actually. <laughs> oh, now, no. you, now, you made that joke. I did. But I uh, I, I was DeGrasse, told someone met him, and women DeGrasse, are all over Tyson. Neil Tyson oh. DeGrasse. Yeah, They're Tyson all DeGrasse. over him. That's awesome. Yeah. The way Carl Sagan would pull him down with that. You know, you can't <laughs> fight. The female sexual drive yeah. cannot fight a safari jacket and a turtleneck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the Steve Austin and one. chat about the stars. They, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. Steve I, Austin. I'm going to make love to you billions and billions of ways. Um, <laughs> so this guy goes, yeah, you know, a lot of what happens is he's uh, what's really changed the scene is these porn actresses come to town, but there's no money in porn anymore because the internet. So they all go into triads. <laughs> like again, triads. Exactly what my manager said. 
triads. That's a nuclear thing, I say, isn't, isn't it? I say manager, like I was yeah. my friend who I, <laughs> who, I, who I work with. My friend who, I, who helps, who listens to me bitch and helps me get jobs. Um, who's guided my career into the cash avalanche that is podcasting. <laughs> but we thank all of the people that donate. Long story longer. He yeah. goes, yeah, they come in and what it is is they'll find like a married swinger couple that has a kid or something, and the, she'll, the porn actress will live with them and help around the house. Is that And, the, true? and it'll become like a three, three-headed marriage. Oh, my And uh, no pun intended. And, uh, and I don't think they all last, which is uh, astounding and they don't, to what, me. What, what I think is... <laughs> I don't think they all last. <laughs> and, and the porn actress and is just all called had... porn actress. No name. Like, yeah, honey, name... are you with the porn actress? Yep. Sweetie, can you send the porn actress into the dining room? That's my toothless dog in the background. Aww. He's probably barking because he saw somebody walking by with a corn on the cob and is <laughs> reminiscing. <laughs> I just stand in front of him now eating apples. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> but so all these uh, swingers live with, like, remind the porn actress that the kids need lunch tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, it's so strange. And I just see the porn actress mumbling under her breath as she's making a peanut butter and yeah. jelly sandwich going, from the crust. I didn't sign up for this yeah. shit. I came down here to be sexually degraded on <laughs> film. <laughs> Not to be... S- making wanted, chicken salad sandwiches. I wanted to be completely abused by psychotics in the valley, not yeah. making peanut butter and jelly. Is it yeah. ready? It's almost. Yeah. I wanted to be tearfully leaving a rented ranch house in Chatsworth after a long day of degradation, pulling one of those two-wheeled stewardess suitcases behind me with my boots and hoochie clothes, <laughs> not picking up Tyson and Derek at three fifteen. Like, and also it well, implies it's right. that you know some the... people are born porn actresses. Like, I think they like... are. <laughs> <laughs> you can like, see in them. other words, because of the internet, like that avenue isn't available, but they still can only be a porn actress. Well, it is amazing too. Like <laughs> the music industry, the TV, like yeah. the internet has just decimated entertainment. <laughs> it's good point. Yeah, the music industry. <laughs> But now, how do those people guys? I know are selling shows to things that I yeah I just sold a show to to uh, Bic Lighters <laughs> what no oh, yeah they have a network now yes <laughs> it's like huh? I sold a sitcom to Colgate dot com it sells toothpaste and has original program uh, we just sold an edgy six part mini series about the prison system to Petco <laughs> <laughs> it's all with baby chicks. Yeah, baby. And Actually, I would totally watch that show. Oz, but with baby chicks. But l- the dialogue of Oz looped in. But you just, it's just baby chicks in a small prison I'm telling set. you, you just came that, up with that, the thing. Genius. You that's just a, came up yeah. with the thing. I would edit that out yeah. so people don't do it. Hello, Mr. Well. That is hilarious. <laughs> that is, I, if you don't do it. I'm too lazy. You've had dental. Yeah, you know. We've both gone through dental hell on earth. Yeah, and uh, it crept up on me just So like- do you, when you go to Britain, do you feel like my people? <laughs> yes, I am now feeling like that. <laughs> That's funny you mentioned it because I used to, of course, be one of these people who would watch television and go, oh, man, they really have bad teeth. Yeah. And then I am one of them. Do you remember the show Are You Being Served? Yes. Which was a very I, broad British sitcom. Oh, you're kidding. That came they had over. a broad... Hold it. They had a broad... <laughs> hang on. Wait a minute. <laughs> it aired on public television, I think, in the 80s or 90s. Yeah, I vaguely and remember. My, I remember the title for yeah. sure. And it was like only in Britain could a guy with that smile be on a television show. Mm. <laughs> it looked like, the, looked like the skyline of Dresden the day after the bombing. <laughs> It looked like Nagoya. (laughs) Now, what is the reason for that? Like, why did the Brit... Is it genetics? Just genetics, diet, inbreeding. You know, with fluoride... Inbreeding. Yeah, it's true. It's a small island culture. Ah. Everybody's, you know, everybody's their own cousin. Ah. Um, Also, it wasn't until the fluoridation of water and, like, mandatory braces that that Americans' teeth sort of became, like... 
decent. Well, my parents, my out of it parents, and I don't want you to cut this out because one is dead and one is barely conscious. <laughs> uh, they fucked me. They didn't give me braces, so well, I always I, had I did, these, neither did mine. I always neither had these mine. crooked fronts, uh-huh. you know. And then people started telling me, "Well, that's you. That's your charm." Yeah, and well, I they're believe right. them. They're right. And but I was, <laughs> I was I was also supposed to get braces. Your teeth and, look fine to well, me. Yeah, <laughs> and I have the receipt. Because oh, that's right. What happened was I ground my teeth down and my jaw didn't fit together anymore, so I had to. So, get... are you telling me you had a bit of an anxiety in your life? D- no. <laughs> I imagine you deny no, it. I was no, absolutely not. At all. not. I, you know, I I've was been pretty stress free. What happened was there was a two parter episode of The Night Rider, and we lost cable before part two. And for the three years until I saw it, I was on edge. <laughs> <laughs> I just was grinding my teeth, and uh, but yeah, what happened was I just had instant orthodontia when they had to crown my upper teeth so that my lower uh, jaw would have a place to to live. It was yes. the worst thing in the yeah. world. Yeah, well, I've had the your root mouth canal. is the gateway to your head, and you have yes. to take good care of it. Yeah, but my dog's dentist said we yanked twelve of his teeth. I was like, well, you should have checked with me on that. Like, Why don't you just turn him into a fish? I mean, <laughs> we uh, we took his legs off, put some fins on him, and he lives in this tub of water now. And and the vet he doesn't just, seem happy. The vet just immediately sticks his dick in your dog's mouth because he has no teeth. Like that's his thing. Yeah, like I just pull all the teeth yeah. and have the dog suck on me. You really have the most perverted vet in the world, and you don't know. It. Yeah, he just has a little Lamborghini with little <laughs> Chihuahuas, teethless Chihuahuas next to him. <laughs> never, never go to forced canine Felatrix Veterinary Hospital. <laughs> Pain of the name is shady. No, no, it's it's close. It's point one miles according to Google Maps. Yeah. We have to go there. <laughs> That's how I go to things, by the way. It doesn't matter yeah. how bad it is. His defense, Your Honor, I'm not going to stick my dick in a mouthful of fangs. <laughs> Case dismissed on logic. Case dismissed. <laughs> I can't fight that logic. Get out of here. The judge is like, oh, I can't stay angry at you. I think courts should just be logic-based. <laughs> Our society has gotten so corrupt morally. Why not? Well, there was a story of this horrible psychopath. It's like this horrible abusive father that was always like No, wait his, a minute. I there know. was a horrible abusive father yeah. in this land? In, in America. And okay. he was always literally like sticking his gun in his kid's face. Like They showed like family photos where he like had his pistol against his kid's face, like smiling. Like just I hope it truly. wound up like the recent one where the kid shot the dad. Yeah, he did. Do you he re- did. Yeah, did yeah. it happen no, like that? Da- yeah, and literally the judge was like, eh. Like it was like, no, it was. It was like it's just, the judge was the like. The judge was like, "This is a piece of shit." This guy. Yeah, no, he really did say. I believe that the world seems to be spinning fine without him. I think he said something like that. I was like, "Yeah, get get out of here." We, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna make a strange analogy to killing an abusive father. To this, okay. If you have a big word on your butt, <laughs> don't give me a dirty look if you see me reading it. <laughs> You know, if juicy is written yeah. on your butt, which is good because when I drive around town, I want to know whose butt is wet. <laughs> um, don't then like, <laughs> I'm sorry, you put a book on your ass. I'm yeah. naturally going to read it. Yeah. Just I, like uh, killing an abusive seen, parent. I haven't seen the juicy thing lately. Well, it's out of Has style. That gone I think it's Has gone that gone away? Away? You know, there are things that I thought were going to be with us forever. Crocs. I, I can't believe Crocs went out of style. Yeah, uh, Crocs have bit the dust. Uh, writing juicy on your ass. Ear cuffs. What happened to the world I thought I knew? Ear cuffs? <laughs> Remember those? What the fuck are they? That's from like the early 80s. Oh, okay. Has there ever been a video of anybody wrestling Crocs like the shoe? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually. In an Australian accent. Actually, we're going to do we're going to oh. put it after my uh Peeps Oz. Oz oh, yes. with Peeps. We have a couple of shows out of this. <laughs> We've got a whole network. I think the Peeps Oz is very good. Or just the rape scenes, but with <laughs> with chicks, baby chicks. In the mid 1980s, a friend of mine showed me a comic It wasn't a comic book. It was a hardcover book of collected comic strips of Drew and Josh Friedman. Among the many amazing things 
was a series of strips about Tor Johnson and his fantasy private life. And it was one of the, I've talked about it before on the show. It was one of the things that really formed my sense of humor. It was like when you see like a light in the fog and you're like, oh yeah, that's the stuff that I like. And especially sort of steered me more into the um, Ed Wood world and like giving a language to how that was funny and beautiful in its own way. And then a couple years later, as I've talked about again, ad nauseum, the film Ed Wood further cemented all that. And people like uh, Drew Friedman and uh, Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, who wrote Ed Wood, were people that I held up as like heroes, like, oh God, I'd love to be like them. And one of the coolest things about being in show business is that I've not only over the years gotten to meet them, I consider them friends and I'm happy to tell you that none of them are dicks. <laughs> and and uh, I am joined today by Drew Friedman. This is the sound of my voice. Drew is making a rare appearance on the West Coast, publicizing his new book, which is called Heroes of the Comics, correct? That's right. The Men Behind the Men in Tights. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's just, uh, the guys you, you, who created these uh, superheroes in comics that everybody knows, but nobody knows what they look like, and now they do, thanks to my book. That was exactly. My, that was my intention. You outed them. Yeah, what they, yeah, yeah. I outed, in my Jewish comedian books, I outed their real names. In this book, I just outed <laughs> their outed, faces. Right. And this book, I just, this is the faces. Like, I took them, you know, I put them in the forefront rather than that's, the background. Now, uh, the other voice you heard belongs to Larry Karaszewski. This is the sound of my voice. And Larry uh, is here as a screenwriter of Ed Wood, People vs. Larry Flynn, Man on the Moon, and very uh, groovy film coming out on December 25th entitled Big Eyes, which is the story of uh, Margaret Keene, which or Walter is, and Margaret Keene. One of the few movies I'm excited about, and one of three movies this year not featuring Iron Man. <laughs> which is a really, which you have to be nervous about. He's in the director's cut. He shows up. Well, the chef didn't feature Iron Man. It just, just the guy who directed it. Right? <laughs> exactly. you know, I just learned yeah. that. Actually. It's Iron Man adjacent. <laughs> right. The- you have to be reminded at all times. It's actually, you mentioned it's one of the three, it's the only film I'm looking forward to, Big Eyes. Yeah. You know? Well, what's interesting about it is, and I do want to get back to uh, the men behind the comics because especially. The Brothers Who Invented Superman, I find a really fascinating story, and I, I want to get to that. But first, here's the unifying theme of Big Eyes and having you two on the show. Now, Scott Alexander, your partner, was going to make it today, but he couldn't make it. He had uh, something that prevented him from getting over. But you work with a partner mm-hmm. and have for a long time, Larry. Drew, you worked for a long time with your brother, Josh, and Walter and Margaret Keene are a somewhat famous in that world, all three partnerships, drastically different. Very different. But all in their own way, like marriages. Walter and Margaret Keene's an actual marriage. <laughs> you guys are brothers. Right. And, and, and you Scott and Scott. And I actually have sex. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that way it's not like a marriage. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but One of my it, favorite interviews Scott and I ever, ever did, we, it was like a book about screen partnerships. And I don't know, for some reason, Scott was really punchy. and he's, and he, Not every, Scott! Every, every, every answer he gave was like that, where they asked us, how do we uh, work through writer's block? And, and he'd say, well, we take showers together, and I I scrubbed it. And the guy, we thought he was in on the joke, but when you get the book, it's literally in the book. It's wow. like, the book is like, there's ideas, uh, take showers together. And, and Scott created this whole thing. The first time I got a check, I went out and bought Jane Mansfield's car. And, and all, I mean, it's this complete, uh. it's this book that is this completely full of nonsense next to other writing partners who took it all seriously. Of it's course. Completely of course. So that's haunted you ever since. <laughs> it's, it's the first people think about it. you guys in the shower together. Mm, I should draw that. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's how Agent Cody. Banks happened. Exactly. <laughs> but wow. it is like a marriage, basically. Absolutely. I mean, and, and, no. and you're also like, we are in this business venture together. We are yeah. financially tied to each other. And, um, no, but it's funny because I actually seen... have a real marriage. And right. it's so interesting that there literally is the only time I am by myself is in my car driving from my marriage to my work marriage. You uh-huh. know? And so if ever I have to talk to anybody or do anything on my own, it's literally that 35 commute, minute commute. Yeah. And then I'm. Well, you do, fi- yeah, and then yeah. you do find like yourself volunteering to go to the. I'll go to the store. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. Right. What do you need? Tampons. Right. I'm on my way. 
Super Bowl Sunday? I had a friend one time say, I finally understand the guys who like live in Connecticut and they take the train into the city, which he never understood. As, I'm very happy with both my marriages. So I'm not, yeah. you know, I don't, you're a I better don't, man than uh, I am. Yeah. Everybody Larry did K. that because they like Rob Petrie was like their role model mm-hmm. when they were growing up. So if he could do it and have so, such a great marriage to a sexy woman like that, be so happy yeah. all the time, yeah. anybody could pull that yeah. off. Unfortunately, more Amsterdam was my role well, Somehow, like, they, they lived up in Mount Vernon, I think, which is like an hour from the city. But somehow, Rosemary right. and Maury Amsterdam, always yeah. lo- walking through the door. Like, the city was right next door. Yeah. It's, like, strange, you know. But really it's brilliant. like living in Altadena. And then Basically, <laughs> yeah, like asking come, people to come. Yeah, but uh, it's gorgeous from, uh, out here. We're, we're here. In, we're in Altadena. We're in a basement in Altadena. <laughs> <laughs> is that one word, Altadena? I don't know. Is that No, it's it? two, I believe, and right. it's a very popular uh, brand of milk out yes, here, too. Yes, it is. Right. We were at the home of uh, comedy legend Tom Gamble. Who's married to Max. <laughs> Who's married to Max Pross. Exactly. Another, oh uh, my another team. Yes. Amazing. But well, you mentioned the Superman creators, Siegel yeah. and Schuster. They actually weren't brothers. They were both Jewish teenagers from Cleveland, and they created Superman. I read a story that it was really the original concept of Superman was that it was an, a dream of assimilation. And that only, I'm quoting... That only a Jewish kid could think that you could be completely mistaken for somebody else if you just put on some glasses. <laughs> Ironically, they both wore glasses. They were nerdy Jewish teenage teenagers from Cleveland. They they couldn't get girlfriends, so they created this you know in, in, impossible. Superhero. They invented the word superhero. Superman, mid thirty. They couldn't even sell it. I talk about this in my book. I write about these guys as well. Their biographies, but they couldn't sell the character. Nobody wanted it. All of a sudden, somebody took a chance with it. It took off, sold a million copies, and then instantly, of course, these two Jewish guys from National Comics that became DC bought all the rights from them instantly for one hundred and thirty dollars, yeah. and that haunted them for the rest of their lives. Oh my God! So they didn't even no, no. they didn't. They, I, I know very little. Characters about made. Oh, no, billi- I know nothing about. I know nothing about comic books. I've never been a comic. Book. The one story I know is their story. Well, that's like another their story. Is this that that it, it just it haunts? Oh my you. God! It's just so sad. It went on and on. Now they had a good career for like ten years working on Superman comics and the comic strip. They were paid well, very fair. But the DC went on to. Make billions finally, and, yes, Warner, literally and then billions. when Warner Communications took over the company, they finally gave him a little stipend. But one of them was already blind at the time. <laughs> the other guy was working as a stock boy at Marvel Comics. Yeah. It was pathetic. It would make for a great movie, actually. Yeah. You know? It's been you pitched to us many times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a great story. Yeah. You know, and a, a, night, ri- a kind of a rise and fall. Cause they they rise, they fall, and they rise slightly at the end. You yeah. know, but it's still very sad. The ghost right. of Tesla comes to them every night. They go to Europe and visit Pete Best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, they all, they all get together. God damn it. Man, man. Shit. You, t- you two, yeah. you had this. Uh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> this but then again, life. you know, Pete Best might have the last laugh. I hate to even think that way, but, you know, if he's two left. Beatles are gone now, and Pete, <laughs> well, is, still, Pete is still is, thriving. Yeah, Paul McCartney wakes up every morning. Ringo dead. <laughs> he yeah, just wants to right. win. No. I'd rather listen to Pete Best's latest than Paul McCartney's, though, I have to admit, <laughs> you know, at this point. <laughs> I mean, it happens to a lesser degree to uh, a lot of people. That whole work for hire. If you, if uh, I knew the people who created Blues Clues, mm-hmm. for example, and when that took off, everyone always assumed. Oh my God! You must be rich, uh, right? But they weren't. So they, you yeah, know, the they, company they, they owned it. Okay. The company right. owned it, and even though she was the voice of Blue, it just you know uh, there was always well next it's, the next time you create a worldwide phenomenon, we'll take care of you. So okay. these, these two guys who created Superman, Siegel and Schuster, they had no lawyer. They were young, their early twenties, and they just signed away without consulting with the lawyer. They just signed away all the rights. Thinking, and this like, is nineteen thirty eight. Just after it took off, the first copy sold out. And they just sold away, you know, uh, once again, $130, which is so pathetic. Was that ever used in any attempts of getting the rights back? Like, we didn't consult with a lawyer. This is a usual Oh, constantly. Contract. For years it went on where they would sue yeah. over and over. It's still happening almost all the time. Well, there's always a new lawsuit. Now their, claims, fam- their families, their families finally, right. like, went, you know, because they're both deceased, as right. is Jack Kirby is on the cover of my book. He also wasn't treated very fairly by this industry he worked in for 50 years, you know, creating all that stuff from Marvel Comics, was paid very poorly, didn't get his artwork back. But finally, at the end, they capitulated and gave him some of the artwork back. And now his family is getting some money, compensation. He died about 10 years ago. My book kind of chronicles those guys. We're really in it for the money to begin right, with. Right. They wanted that for the love of No one dra- becomes drawing. a cartoonist. For Not them. really. No, well, so, you know, Charles Schultz, maybe, you know, he, I don't think My he friend's a even. poet and he's rich. How can I make money? Yeah. There are ways to get rich, but a lot of these guys didn't set out thinking that way. They just loved what the, you know, they, this, uh, 
uh, the world of comic books opened up in the 30s and all these young artists who love to draw like their heroes, Milton Kniff and Alex Raymond. And all of a sudden, all this comic book work happened, most of it superhero work. And they were just thrilled to have the work. They didn't think about the future or making money or you know, getting rich. My guests today are comedian, writer, actor, hand model, Jonah Ray. This is the sound of my voice. I'm also joined by filmmaker and a a good friend who has uh, one of the best documentaries I've seen uh, in the past 10 years, Denny Tedesco. This is my voice, Dana. Now, we were talking about, like... Having a gig, having a job that you love, that's jo- that we were talking about having a job that pays well, that is eating your soul, yeah, and yeah. then just striking out to do something that you love and care about. And the trick is, is that really a good move? I think it is. It's worked out for me. I've done it a couple times in my life where I've... Um, I've been at a job and I've been miserable and then, you know, something that seems more creatively fulfilling comes around and it's, but it's so temporary and it's so less, so much less money. But then, uh, taking that leap and doing something for the pure reason of, you know, creative fulfillment has ended up leading to getting, you know, to a place where I can get that money again. Right. So it's, and it's happened a couple times. Like I left the Rotten Tomato show for Web Soup. Web Soup was only like six episodes, but then when we ended up doing three seasons. And then when I was at The Soup, I left right. The Soup and like with the hopes that I can pick up, you know, money through acting work and, right. and, and comedy in general. And that's worked out. So right. it's like, well, I, now yeah. you're on fire. So yeah. it, it actually. I'm smoldering. Yeah. But it, it did work out. It did work out. Yeah. Yeah. It did. No, people thought I was a lunatic when I left The Simpsons. And they still and do. They still yeah. do. Yeah. And I've joined them. <laughs> <laughs> but what was your worst job you can ever think uh, you had the worst job but did something come out of it uh well the worst job i ever had was in high school delivering f- prescription drugs to nursing homes That's which is harsh. really really depressing a lot of trust to give a kid a lot of trust to give a kid and just and it's winter in new england so it's dark at four it's cold, it's miserable, and you just spend four hours with dying people. It's just wow. not a great gig. That's your paper route. Yeah, that yeah. was my paper route, yeah. Wow. That was really brutal. But you did, I mean, you're sort of the definition of uh, labor of love. Yeah, you know what? But you made a documentary about your father. Yeah, but labor of love, you know what it means. It means... No one else is going to come up to help you. No one's paying you. It's just such a, yeah, it's a... Yeah. Larry Flint would argue that. <laughs> <laughs> I checked. Larry didn't want to do it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us now. The, uh, your documentary is called The Wrecking Crew. Yep, yeah, The Wrecking Crew. And it's, uh, it's, what was The Wrecking Crew? Well, The Wrecking Crew was a nickname for the session players in the 60s in Los Angeles that were, they were the guys and a lady, Carol Kay, who basically did all the recordings for uh, the Fit Dimension, the Beach Boys, Jan and Dean, Mamas and Papas, Frank Sinatra, uh, Nancy Sinatra, Johnny Rivers, anything that was coming through L.A., the record companies always had these uh, session players do it. Mm -hmm. And the reason, supposedly, that they were called the Wrecking Crew, which came much later, and there's if there's any controversy, it's the name, is because they said, the older guys said, these younger guys doing this rock and roll stuff, is they're going to ruin the business. They're going to, you know... Wreck the business. Wreck the business. Thank you. <laughs> Make it, wreck the business. <laughs> the ruining crew. The ruining was the original crew. title. <laughs> it was. It was a, exactly. <laughs> they were going to wreck the didn't business. Pop. No, it, it did. Good. And it doesn't look good on a logo either. The ruining crew. Yeah, the ruining Unless crew. you spell crew like Motley Crew with the U. Yeah. 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 Or it that, could be no, like- actually, that's my uh, wine. I oh, is do. it? Yes, <laughs> I do have a wine. Yes, you too can buy a bottle of wine with Wrecking Crew. No, so they were going to wreck the, the business. The poster says "Live, Die, Repeat." The Ruining Crew. Yes. So it's a very confusing title. Oh, boy. I'm going to hear the end. I'm never going to hear the end of this show. <laughs> so once they said they were going to ruin the business, ruin the business, you did it again. Wreck the business Wreck playing the business. this rock and roll shit. That's right. what it was. The older guys didn't want to play it. You know, they were A, the music was maybe sometimes trite, 
mm-hmm. or it was low budget. This or is early 60s? Early 60s. Right. You know, so these guys, the older session guys that were doing the movies here or whatever they were doing, they were getting paid. It was a union gig. Maybe these guys were doing demos and they didn't, you know, maybe they were low budget or they were doing non union at the time. Mm-hmm. So they didn't want anything to do with it. So these guys moved in. They start doing Phil Spector's Wall of Sound. They start doing this and everybody goes, oh, who are these guys? And that's how it started. Wow. And the guitarist was? Well, the guitarist was, well, one of the guitarists was my father, Tommy Tedesco. Um, my father, Glenn Campbell, was on guitar. Uh, Bill Pittman, Billy Strange, Al Casey, there are a few. The drummers were basically Hal Blaine, who was one of the greatest rock and roll drummers of all time, and Earl Palmer, another legend. And uh, bass players, there was one woman named Carol Kay. Um, Joe Osborne, another phenomenal. Jeez. And Don Randy was on piano. Uh, Leon Russell was on piano. It was about Larry Nectel. Larry Nectel, mm-hmm. who ended up uh, going on to create bread. But uh, I didn't know he created bread. Well, he was with uh, David. You know, they were together. They, I didn't know yeah. that was them. Yeah. He also played with Elvis, did he not? Yeah. Yeah, they all they all play with Elvis at some point. Right. Your yeah. dad played with Elvis. Yeah. Your dad, dad is on the 68 comeback special. Yeah. yeah. As is yours, dad. Am I correct, Jonah? If he was at the show in Hawaii, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> My dad was on the Elvis 68 comeback special in the scene where uh, the guy teaches Elvis how to tie a lure. But they cut that out. It was the sm- there was a <laughs> small, a small bass fishing runner in the Elvis 68 comeback special. There was the black leather jumpsuit. Which was like the the jam, yeah, and then the white suit with Elvis in the on the stage in big letters, and then the Sea Runner, which they didn't do, was Elvis on a small boat in Massachusetts <laughs> hunting for bass and musky, <laughs> and that got cut. What I find really interesting about that is you're not even into rock that much. Well, I mean, I'm into rock in a sense of you know growing up with rock, but I'm not. I wasn't like a heavy metal kid in the yeah. 70s when i grew up i was listening to a lot of jazz but or a lot of like steely dan stuff mm-hmm. i wasn't into a lot of the pop my dad was not into the rock he hated it and he it's made, amazing he made it oh yeah he, he but like the first time i walked into your home there was a guitar framed on the wall right and i said what's that and you said i'm paraphrasing you yeah and you're right here um which may, many do but it was like, this is the guitar that my dad, what did he play on this? Oh, that was the guitar that he did, the Bonanza theme, Green Acres theme. Jesus. Um, Monsters theme. Mon- no, he didn't do Monsters. I that's Jack was- Marshall. Oh, I thought that was your yeah. dad. I've been no, telling no, no. people that for well, years. Well, that's okay. Keep telling him. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> Anybody who I've told my friend's dad played the Monsters theme, I was lying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the other theme they think is uh, him, which he did the movie, was um, uh, Twilight Zone. So when he did the movie, he wanted to know who did the theme to the original TV show, and they said that was actually music from some French composer. So it was a French uh, recording. Andrew oh, Savage, wow. I think. I don't know where, where wherever look. the recording came from. It's over there in yeah. that room. Um, <laughs> but but uh, he did the Hawaii Five O theme. He did the Hawaii Five O Ventures. The, the okay. actual theme is not. It's it's horn driven, f- right? Yeah. So the Ventures. Who isn't? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened in um, the Ventures was. Um, Basically, he ended up um, getting a call from uh, Joe Saracino, who was producing The Ventures. And The Ventures also is famous for no lyrics to any of their songs. Right. Right. So they're a garage band, basically, out of Seattle. So he puts them into the situation where they shouldn't be in. The Ventures always do their own stuff. So now he's brought these guys in to do a recording of Hawaii Five-0, thinking it's going to be great, surf, da-da-da. But unfortunately, they don't read music. So he ended up... Um, panic and he called my father and <laughs> um funny. my father comes in the next day and he says he literally just to bust his balls he plays it behind his head you didn't get braces i never got braces w- was, your, uh, your par- was it just over- not on your parents radar or dude like i said they, w- my they were so fucking like- self-absorbed i try not to hold it against them especially the dead god one. it's the same exact thing <laughs> No, I mean, I'm like, no, I'm, I you know, you me. know, it's like, oh, well, you know, that whole thing about, well, you can't be bitter, you know, just. <laughs> no, either, there comes a time in your life. To let it go, right? When you just have to go like, my adulthood cannot be dedicated to the grudges of my yeah. adolescence. Yeah. You know, you, you have to come to. Come Even to though that's a big this. one. And that's how I fuck myself up because I'll be like, you know, Eddie, just let it go. 
like what you just said. You can't yeah. hold grudges into your adult. And then I'll be, yeah, but. And then I'll go, I'll do yeah. the yeah, but. but. I'll be like, yeah, but my teeth, they should have taken care of my fucking. As I'm driving bumper to bumper yeah. on the 405. Why didn't they take care of my fucking yeah. teeth? As I I'm going to an audition. Resi- <laughs> yeah. Residual anger from my childhood pops up on my psyche like an unwanted Adobe update. <laughs> That means often in yeah, my life. It's like an iTunes update. Really? Yeah. 80% of iTunes use is updating iTunes. <laughs> it's like, and what I'm trying to say I is anger in- is my flash player. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to get the metaphor and you just nailed it. At a certain point, like, okay, I'm mm-hmm. done. Mm. Because it is when you're booting up. And if you boot up your computer wrong, as they say, like, don't turn off your computer while it's booting up. It's the same thing as like up until about like 16, 17, you're booting up. And if something gets screwed up there, it just hinks everything you do. Yeah. And there just comes a time when you go, yeah, it's done. They did the best they could. Yeah. But doesn't say much for their level of effort, (laughs) but they did the best they could. So my teeth, yeah, and then I started having fucking like uh, a root canal here, a root canal there. It sounds like a, a farmer's song. Root I, canal I, here and a root canal there. I don't know of any teeth in my mouth that have yet to have root canals. Do you get angry when you meet people who are like, oh, I've never had a cavity? Oh, there are people yeah. I go into in a blind, 40s. I go into are a blind fucking, rage. Yeah. Those people sit around with the people that can't gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> I can't gain weight and I uh, money never stops yeah. coming to me. Uh, yeah, I have this I don't know what the fuck it is. I have this weird thing the less I eat the more I shit hundreds. <laughs> yeah, it seems to work out well for you. This was upsetting me. I've been reading Stephen Fry's biography. Uh-huh. And uh well he's got two. First one is called Moab is my wash pot, which was his early years. Right. I don't even know what the reference is. He explained it. It's uh-huh. a biblical thing. And then the second one just Stephen started Fry, off- Hugh Laurie's old comedy partner. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fr- uh, a bit of Fry and Laurie. It's but really Fry funny. started his second biography, just called uh, Fry Chronicles, with this whole fucking thing about sugar and how sugar almost killed him. He became diabetic and blah, oh, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And he just talked about his sugar addiction as a kid. And, uh-huh. and I kind of have a sugar addiction right now. <laughs> I sure. don't know what hole in my life I am trying to fill, but lately well, it's also around, I see, cannot stop. Well, I've gone vegan. I think that has something to do oh, with it. Oh, Jesus. I think missing eating meat and stuff has – I don't know what it is. but I know on Halloween I was eating fun-sized candy long after it stopped being fun. <laughs> Were there tears? Yeah. There, there, is, there, is there a grim futility size? <laughs> <laughs> no, the porn actress the new, just yeah. kept throwing them at you. Yeah, the new. You were like, like you know how they say pull. You'd be like, <laughs> porn actress. <laughs> she just threw you a fun size. Yeah. Oh man. I was not a cat dude. Yeah, me neither. Didn't me think neither. I, didn't think I wanted cats. Same here. Yeah, my adult female social companion mm-hmm. came upon this one cat. Yeah, and then now I have cats, and they're fun. Oh, they're I great. like them a lot. Yeah, you know, they make, I'm, I'm very much a. There's they always, soften the brunt of uh, the industry we're in, and there's a, yeah. <laughs> and there's also uh, a room. That I have a very always room for one more mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. source of anxiety. <laughs> Let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> always room for one more addiction <laughs> in my life. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm amazed at the bottomless pit that I am. Oh, it's amazing. No. <laughs> It's very funny you say that. So you were in Hawaii on Halloween. Correct. Maui. Maui. I, I find that interesting because as I get older, yeah. I have gone from a guy that liked Halloween to a guy that is psychotic you about are, it. You are funny about Halloween. Now, what is it? I well Because my wife, my adult social Because I'm now like... Could you go to Maui on Halloween? Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> like, because I got offered to go to that same festival. I was like, yeah. how dare you even ask? It was just, it was, it was so, it was like. We talked about this a little too, because I like to bitch about the current weather in LA, which never goes below 90. Yeah. 
basically. I'm always like, well, this is I'm it. When really, there's a, when I'm there's, really over it. When there's a coolish day, I always say to my wife, honey, it's finally over. Like, we're getting through I something. I, and it always comes back. I'm like, I fuck was, this place. I was literally mulling over a trip to Portland just to wear a coat. Dude, I came you know, from, way- I did Portland and Minneapolis before Maui. So I was like, oh, this is how real people live. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and it was beautiful. It was fall in both places. There is a 35-year drought cycle that we are in and that is but, cresting now. So I don't think it's all. And we're in the middle of it. And I'm not change. built for drought. I don't know if you, yeah. you know, if people could see me. I am not built for drought. I need a lot of water. Yeah. Well, you do have a hump. <laughs> <laughs> Which is in my front. He has, yeah, he has a front. Ed, Ed has what I would describe as a glorious front hump. Low lying, low hanging, <laughs> low lying front, uh, low hanging front. The low hanging my, front humps are at the Roxy all week, and I think it's also being from the East Coast. Yeah, it's like okay, yeah. it's November. I need it gray. I need it kind of rainy. I want to listen to the. I want to listen bit. to the Cure. Yeah, man, and, and, and find that music applicable. I always or whatever uh, the modern version of the Cure is. I believe it's. Uh, who is it? I don't. Uh, do you know any modern? Do you? Yes, have I you do. Kept up with music a bit. Yeah, uh, Interpol. Uh, Interpol. If you like, yeah, you like Interpol. Also, it's good if you don't music. like the jam, you can listen to the. It's like the jam. Yeah. I like the jam, and now I can listen to the Killers of the Arctic Monkeys. It's the same thing. I feel like I'm so far behind with music that it's too much of a mountain for me to climb. Well, it's also because of my kids. I know a lot about what that's current, good. Like, yeah. but, but I don't know. Like I know Taylor Swift and Ariana Grande and all that. that I'm not uh-huh. that I'm not really supposed. I to hear know Taylor Swift's name and I turn off. Is that right of me or is she good? I just. just I mean, it's just. I, just, I also. I it's just, like I'm my like, standard is so much lower. Now, why I've been forced by circumstance to live in the world, um, and <laughs> oh, I think you really hit home with me on that one. It's really true because I am. I still don't live in the world. Oh yeah, no. I mean, I would be so if I didn't have children, I would be so. I would be so up my own ass. Yes, no, I'd just yes. be up my own, up your own ass. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. About all your opinion, like yeah, I just know. like television. I like, know. I don't watch anything after right. 1968. Did you watch the news? What news? I watched a documentary on the Tet Offensive. That's the only news I can <laughs> I gotta be so locked into it. So I, I feel like you're making fun of me now, and I don't like it, really. No, I'm not. It's just me. It's just my yeah. id. Like, the Taylor, like Shake It Off, the, the new Taylor Swift song. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I didn't know. Is it's it a good? great song. Yeah, I'll check it it's out. It's a great song. It's a very similar beat to Hey Ya. What's so funny is um, that it's, I'm, it's, I'm It's like, a great song. I'm, I'm like the most bitter, angry guy, but then I'll hear Pharrell's happy and be like, I kind of like it. Yeah. And you can only kind of admit it to yourself. Well, like, hating everything, <laughs> hating everything is an easy, lazy stance. And I don't know if you know any death. comedians that are excessively cynical. Uh, <laughs> comedians I know that are excessively cynical, yeah. everything so, yawn. Yeah. Like people that yeah. say, you know, oh, TV all sucks. Actually, TV, some of the greatest shit that's ever been on is on TV. Yeah. Much more so than movies. TV has, yeah. you know, it's like, really? TV sucks? Sherlock sucks? Really? You know, Sherlock like was all good. these. This is amazing shit. True Detective sucks. Game of Thrones sucks. No, TV's awesome. You just, like everything else, it's a, like a Whitman sampler. You yeah. gotta pinch a couple to get yeah. to the good stuff. Yeah. The orange creams. Let's just call a spade a spade here. <laughs> the orange creams. As I sit here pinching the Whitman sampler of my life, pinching a Whitman sampler actually sounds like something that a but polite person would say candy. after a Mexican meal. I'm going to pinch a Whitman sampler, darling. Please excuse me. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to go to the I'm going to go to the pool house. I don't trust it. <laughs> no, you were saying that you have gotten psychotic. Oh, about Halloween. About Halloween. And, and I, how does that progress and why? Is it the kids? Did the kids... I think the kids... St- no, it wasn't the kids. It was... Like their joy of it? That certainly helped it. But for me, it was mm-hmm. also... It was like... It was a thing that I wanted to enjoy. I liked it. Then I realized I loved it. And then it became like my thing. <laughs> that's, you know? that's what's funny about it's it. It's my thing. It's like, no, no, no. Is the appropriation... Yeah. ...of the holiday. Yeah. And it, to me, it's the month of <laughs> October. Like, I... You know, do you want to go to Minneapolis October 16th to 19th? Oh, I'm going to miss corn maze. 
Oh, I see. You want to stay in L.A. even though the weather is Is 100 degrees. You want to stay in L.A. to access the things you associate with Halloween. Yeah, I have to go to – yeah, exactly. Because it's more Halloween-y in Minneapolis (laughs) than it is here. But I worked at the Comedy Gallery in Minneapolis on Halloween one year. I remember like 1999. I'm like, what the fuck was I thinking? (laughs) I would never take a gig in L.A. Yeah, it wasn't married. I had no kids. Now I'm just like – I'm like a mother badger about it. <laughs> I find it very, very strange. It's just like... Yeah. What is your favorite I, thing? I, I love all of those things. I lo- Universal. Well, I, like the, I love all of those things because for mm-hmm. a brief period of time, everybody is into the stuff that I'm into, which is really nice. And also, I love going to like the Pierce College haunted corn maze in Northridge. Jesus it, it, but it's it's a How little bit... find that? It's a little bucolic. So it, it sort of reminds yeah. me of just like... The idealized version of where I grew up. It's sort of like revisiting an, an idealized version of childhood. Although I had yeah. great Halloweens as a kid. And as, yeah, it's just like, can I just have this one thing? Thanksgiving, I couldn't give a fuck less about Thanksgiving. Like, I, <laughs> like, I talk to people like, oh, my favorite holiday is Thanksgiving. Really? Uh-huh. Not Arbor Day? <laughs> <laughs> You mean All you I like know sitting is, around with your family and recriminations and yeah, the pilgrims, overeating? The pilgrims going, let's make this the genocidiest Thanksgiving ever. <laughs> no, I just, uh, I, I don't give a monkey about Thanksgiving. And then Christmas is just a complete ball buster. You mean just all the... Uh, There's so many, uh, so many UCB get. holiday shows you're not invited to appear on. <laughs> To me, Christmas is just an endless parade of shows I'm not invited to do. <laughs> is that wrong? UCB mailing list. Please remove. Please remove. <laughs> Please remove. So many food bank benefits I could not be a part of. I have on my computer something called Google Unalert, things I'm not on. <laughs> I get alerted to. <laughs> As Larry knows, I refer to Bob Kane as the Walter Keene of comics because he took full credit for creating Batman. He could barely draw. He might have drawn the first issue, but another guy created the character, uh, Bill Finger, and, and then another guy drew it, Jerry Robinson, and other artists. Bob Kane got full credit, most of the bulk of the money. He got the only credit, Bob Kane's Batman. These guys went anonymous for years until my book is out. Now it's a, they've, been, they've been all... Bob Kane has basically been outed over the last few years as a fraud. You know? uh-huh. And he couldn't really even draw. He learned how to draw Batman's face. And he would go to comic conventions and draw, like, on a blackboard, and that was it. What but, was the basis of this claim, that he, he came up with the idea of the character? Well, he, like, uh, for 50 years, he claimed he conceived it, he drew right. it, he inked it, everything. These guys never got credit, till years later. And right. there's but no Bob- reason for that. I mean, I think that it's also, it's the type of personality that drives you to the fore, that gets you there, that is the thing that causes you to do that. There's a sort of a personality type, and it's a chicken of the egg. It's like, are these people assholes, or is it just a side effect of that level of ambition? Just to follow up on Bob King one last time, he learned from the mistake of Siegel and Schuster, who had just created Superman the year before. He came along a year later, created Batman. What happened to those guys was not going to happen to him, and he knew that. He signed a very cushy deal with National DC Comics, which gave them uh, a lot of the. Uh, they basically split the money, you know, but he made a fortune because Batman took off even beyond Superman, possibly over the years. So, again, he wasn't going to repeat the same mistake as Siegel and Schuster. So, was, right. even a year later, they was already it was known, already it was known. A gigantic wow. these two, mistake. These two right. dumb young guys who created this iconic character sold away everything for $130. And, right. you know, even in 1935, it was probably a good week. They, they were like, added, oh my God, they, yeah, you know yeah. what? That stupid thing we drew with the S, we got a hundred and we got a hundred yeah. bucks. They were it. happy, and the one guy had to convince the other, no, no, let's sign the check. It's good, and we'll get more money. And they actually padded out the check. National Comics, they were clever. They padded it out to four hundred and forty dollars by adding on some other monies owed to them for some other work they did. So it was like a substantial amount of money for a guy, two guys who were twenty, twenty-one years old. Right. Like we got to cash this, of course. Right. And it said right on the check, on the back, you buy casting this check, you transfer all rights to the Superman character, to National DC Comics, forever, basically. Wow. Yeah. In all, forever in all media. Exactly. Right. Strange enough, they had that clause. That <laughs> they had that, right. that, in that all clause. media forever. But they were like, the guys at National were sharks, and they saw it coming, you know. They, yeah. they well, knew what they had. Well, Matt wow. Groening also was very, learned the lesson of mm-hmm. those guys, too, when he created The Simpsons. He absolutely... 
right. got his imprimatur on. And this happens to a lot of like songwriters. Class, I'm not classic, comparing classic that. Classic I'm not comparing that to Bob. Yeah, sure, sure. Those, those well, especially the black ones like yeah. Bo Diddley. Yeah. You know, pay Bo Diddley. Right. You know, there are, it exists today where certain artists uh, won't. Uh, by artists, I mean singers. They consider them, themselves songwriters, so they will not hear a finished song. So you can only submit to them songs oh, that aren't finished. See. So they'll hear your song ah. like, oh, oh, you know, we're missing this one little line it here, theirs. and becomes ha- they nice. get, they get co writer credit because well, they, Michael they came Jackson up- wasn't Michael Jackson notorious for that? Um, uh, I, like I, I, people I, sending him songs, and he would make a slight change, and yeah. it became his song. Yeah, that's what I heard. Well, one <laughs> great story of that is Alexander Courage was uh, hired to write the theme song to a show called Star Trek. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they used it, and his checks were not nearly the size that he thought they should be. So he checked and found out that Gene Roddenberry uh, took his music and wrote some lyrics to it. So wow. he was oh, the co-writer. Wow. And so even and though the, you never heard the lyrics. <laughs> those lyrics are terrific. You, you can get Have there. you heard the lyrics? No, I've never heard the lyrics. Well, oh, I, wanna, I know them. I know oh, them. Sing them, please. Well, I, well, I'm not going to sing them, but I'll recite them. Recite them. Essentially. <laughs> really? And it was just Gene Roddenberry's way of uh, getting a little more do re mi in the door. So there were lyrics. Like was, Beyond the rim of starlight, our love wandering in star flight. I know your journey ends never. Our Star Trek will go on forever. And now as you wander the starry sea, remember, remember me. Wow. Which it sounds, is exactly it sounds like, what the show is. You had me it at sounds rim. like a Shatner, a Shatner poem. <laughs> it does. Has he recorded? You had me at rim. It'll- and by the way, another big money giveaway: Rod Serling, in about 1965 or 66, sold The Twilight Zone to CBS for about 60 grand. Mm. And never to knew this that. day, Carol just kind of shakes her head. Hmm. Really? His widow, Carol Sterling. I never knew that happened. How about Night yeah. Gallery? Did he hold on to that one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You couldn't get Night uh, Gallery. Yeah. This was going to be the Bert one. Bert well, like- playing a tree that's a haunted Vietnam veteran. I'm not going to give away the money for this. <laughs> Again, those guys who created Superman, Siegel and Schuster, they created 10 years later. I said, they came back. Okay, we're going to come back with a character, and we're going to own the rights this time, and we're calling him Funny Man. You know? And it was a comedian, but he was a superhero. But he would like attack his, you know, the villains by like shooting water into their faces from a, a fake flower oh, no. or you know, popping balloons in their face. It was terrible. <laughs> Funny Man looked just like Danny Thomas. Yeah. It was about seven issues of it. It went completely in the toilet, but they retained all rights to that. There you so. go. They and then Funny Man has Funny Man fans. sounds like an asshole. He was. He was obnoxious and like kind of like Danny Kaye, except you know I love Danny Kaye, but still obnoxious. He like destroyed his villains by being obnoxious, right. but it went nowhere. It well, was- Myla Nurmi, who you have drawn and you have written, spent her entire life grabbing on to the rights yeah. to Vampira. She had a situation in the 1980s when they wanted to do Vampira again, and she was hired by local radio, and she brought in all the drawings of the sets. They designed the set, and she helped mm-hmm. cast the actor. And the day of the shooting of the very first episode, and she was not living high on the hog yeah, at absolutely all. Absolutely not. You know, had a little jewelry store, a single woman in her at that time in her like late 60s, early 70s, basically living on public assistance and what she could sell from jewelry she made. And this was a good gig. And literally at the very last minute, I believe it was KTLA. I'm not exactly sure. I certainly have all the paperwork. Hmm. They said, her, oh, hey, by the way, you have to sign this. And it was basically you surrender all rights. Hmm. And that was the first thing that she said walking in the door was, I'm not going to sell you the rights. I'll retain the rights of the character. You hire me as a producer and I'll help you do this. Hmm. Great. Literally that morning, do this and we'll give mm. you your money. And she's like, I'm not going to do this. Mm. And she walked out and they're like, well, we're shooting in two hours. What do we do? Change your name. All right. It's Elvira. Let's uh, do it. Uh, wow. wow. It was literally that morning. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, you when know. you guys were making it. Uh, we had the similar thing. I, I'm not sure she ever signed contract. No, she didn't. And I know why. You know, <laughs> at that point. She, she was on assistance, I believe. Yeah, that she was, was on SSI. Yeah. Did you meet her back then? Oh, yeah, then? yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, and I, I, I know you know her well. Yeah, yeah. She was on SSI and was afraid that if she made any money. They would take it off. They would take it off. And I literally drove her to the legal counsel for the elderly, and the woman explained to her, like, your SSI checks are inviolate. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter. You can make money. You can accept money. And just she wasn't going to do it. And these people that grew up in the Depression, you know, you can almost understand the paranoia. They know what it's like. But it totally freaked out uh, Disney. Who were financing that movie? They were right. like, "This woman has not signed it," you know. And so, like yeah. day, the day of, they were freaking out. But yeah. we just did it anyway. But she, yeah. pro- you know, she was savvy, and I'm sure she knew the story of the Superman 
brothers. And, I you guess know, I, she knew something. I was so obsessed with her and Tor Johnson and that, the way they looked. Even when I was a little kid, just seeing footage of Plan 9 on TV, I hadn't seen the film. And I had no idea what it was about. I just saw that beautiful black and white footage of them roaming around graveyards and right. whatnot. And I was so taken with her, that face she made and the costume. And then years later, it dawned on me, well, it's kind of like, you know, maybe Charles Adams invented that costume. You know, I never said that publicly, but I'm saying it now. No, well, um, he did. And she knew that. She was discovered very briefly. You know this. She went to a big costume ball in L.A. called the Ball Carib, and she was discovered. She mm. went as Morticia Adams, mm. who did not have a name at that time. Right, right. Not till the 60s, uh, right. Right, and uh, Hunt Stromberg, who was a local TV producer, said, hey, we have these uh. movies. We'd like you to host them. Do this. And she was like, well, I don't want to just rip off Charles Adams, so let me kind of do something uh. that makes it a little different. And so she kind of sexed her up a little bit, mm. but literally did that because she didn't want to, in her view, just rip off Charles Adams. Right, right, right. You worked in record stores for you. Yeah, I was in bands growing up and then I worked right. in record stores for a while. And that's sort of like, would you, do you think that that's your, like if you could do anything, like would you, like, like no financial concerns? Yeah, like, I'd probably you, have just a little record shop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was also maybe like a slash venue slash bar slash coffee shop kind of thing. There's a place in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, called the Bottle Tree. It sounds cool. It's it's a great. It's like you walk in. There's a little cafe space, but then there's also around the corner from that, like uh, that counter. There's a full bar, and then there's uh, like a whole area to sit down and you know play board games. And then at night, bands play. Right. And there's also another corner where they have like records for sale. And in the back, there's an airstream trailer where bands stay in uh, when they're playing. It's just the like yeah. the most cool thing ever. And like yeah. it's like if you just create your own little playground, that would probably be like the key. If you're going to the last bookstore. I love the last bookstore. See, that the last place bookstore. Is, yeah. If I could, that's what I want to do. I want to work. I want to like run the last bookstore. Have a little room where I can write stuff. Yeah, and but also hang out at the book, work at the bookstore, but also just go. I need to read over here. Yeah, write something, get lunch, and that would be great. Yeah, I miss that. And to have my, e- I would need to have my ego removed too, to, like, to not to not like desire fame or money. Or no, well, not, not or just like success, you know, success and stuff like that. Fame, I gave up on. But to me, just to own your own store and be happy with the stuff you're doing, that shouldn't uh, itself. Be. So it would. So you're right. It would be fame. My limited, crazy, minor fame. The problem yeah. is uh, our country My or our- tic tacky and fame. <laughs> <laughs> we have a warped sense of what success is. Yes, I and mean, I think we're a different generation. I'm probably the oldest here, but my kids, you know. Their success is they're looking at, you know, channel whatever. They're not wanting to be actors, but they think, oh, my God, they're famous. I want to meet them. We'll come back to that. Yeah. The interesting thing about fame itself that I think is kind of interesting is how much it's been devalued. You know, if, uh, Kim Kardashian's famous because she's got a bum. You know, it's like, no, oh, good. It doesn't make, doesn't seem so, doesn't, doesn't seem to be a thing you should really want that much. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's different for a lot of people, though. I think, um, you know, for f- fame for a lot of people, I think, is recognition to be able to, like, I know who you are. Right. And it's a, it's a neat little feeling to have that. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, it's getting blurred where it's, it's becoming less about the thing you do and then more about who you are. It's, a, it's Social media has become, it's like everyone's kind of developing their own, like, personality 2.0, which is, like, they make this personality of, like, this is what I'm like, and then yeah. they wait for people to enjoy that thing. And so to them... That, that personality that they've cultivated online is like something they've made. You know, it's like, oh, I, this is the music I post. This is the, uh, the pictures right. I take. These are the things. Here's my thing. And then when people start responding to it say on Twitter or likes on Facebook or, you know, comments on Instagram, you have this, like, it's like, they're like, ooh, you know, that's, that's the recognition. And that's like, they feel that they're famous off of something they made, which is really just a version of themselves, which is where it gets really muddy. No, it is true. And, it, and it's all, uh, what do you do to, to get it? Um, Walter and Margaret Keene and you know Walter became famous off of his wife's work yeah and that was more important to him you know and it was just like is that a sociopathy or is he a go-getter in business all the time you know the higher up in business these people they'll just cut your eyeballs out if they have to it's like yeah he's a good businessman you know at at what point do you just go "Ah, that's not for me Uh, I don't think so hopefully sooner than later yeah, you know <laughs> <laughs> the mile wide river of human debris that I've left. <laughs> <laughs> For whatever reason, mm-hmm. 
I find myself increasingly interested in Halloween as a holiday. Not so much like learning new things about it, but like I'm going to do it and it's going to be my thing. And as a kid, I was I loved monsters. As a kid, I had all that famous monsters yeah. magazine and stuff like that. Yeah. What was the thing? So that, that's as what you it were is. a kid, your monster was, love. Yeah. Was were you into baseball? What was your thing? As yeah, a kid? I was more not from, from. I was into Staten really Island, right? being alone. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be funny if a, it would serial, be funny if a some... serial killer like logically justified it. Like you know, I my thing is being alone. And, and 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 being desperate about it that's my thing <laughs> i don't kill people cuz i want them dead i just don't no. want them to be there i just don't want them to be there i still think i saw a dead guy the other night i was Did on you the, think you saw I was a dead on the, guy i was on the freeway and there was an off ramp and there's a couple of cop cars oh yeah and a down motorcycle and a guy oh. lying there I yeah thought, yeah he might be dead you see people on motorcycles on yeah. the freeway and it was like, because in a car, you have like an airbag, you have a crash cage, you have all this stuff. In, in the, oh, in the motorcycle. Like, motorcycle. My worst thing. helmet. <laughs> my worst thing. We want to at least know the shape of your head, you know, because you're just yes. done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I've seen motorcycle accidents here in LA. Like, I've just seen them. Have you ever seen one? Well, no, but it's as a couple. Where have you seen really? Have you really seen motorcycle accidents? Like, yeah, one guy got right up. It was on Sunset Boulevard. It was like prime time L.A., like a Saturday night, and of course, this guy was like speeding. You know the way motorcyclists just feel like the rules of the road don't really apply. don't apply to yeah. me. Yeah, and by the way, I've seen a couple of bumper stickers lately that say on cars that say "Always be aware of motorcycles," and I wish I had a corresponding bumper sticker to lay on there like <laughs> fuck these guys because yeah. they always scare the shit out of me because i always see them at the last second passing me yeah on the right and i'm like ah yeah exactly. you know, i was just about to go there you fucking cocksucker yeah 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 it, or you see like somebody riding double on the freeway like a double? girl on the back of a, oh guy's, i don't I'm know what like, they're thinking and as a as a parent of i was like i will saw the head off of anybody that tells my daughter to get on the back of their motorcycle. Yeah. Like, and I'm belted into a crash cage with airbags, and you're just like, hang yeah. on. <laughs> we're going 90 miles an hour down an asphalt tube. And they're very confident. Though, the, yeah, we're going. The motorcyclists yeah. are psychotically confident. Yeah. Get on. Yeah, get on. No, yeah. come on. You're going to be fine. Well, my girlfriend's a nurse, and she's like, oh, yeah, a guy came in and had no skin on his leg. <laughs> like, oh, oh, they see that shit all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. It's just like, the worst motorcycle. Thing. The worst and they just get like this and a motorcycle. <laughs> I know. I don't I don't understand doctor, you know, the way they get removed from stuff. I, I guess it's like us when a show's been canceled. I'm going to read you a text. Yeah, they let they cancel that show. Really? Yeah, it's just like yeah. But I was on it. Yeah, yeah, they canceled it. This is what she sent me like, "How was work? Today was exhausting. I helped turn my patient over and discovered that she basically had her butt removed, so it was just this flesh muscle thing with a dangling rectum." Oh my God! Then another patient that almost is a turn on. Then another patient almost stopped living, and then because I'm a sensitive person who cares about her life, I just responded. The dangling rectum is my favorite E. E. Cummings poem. <laughs> 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 I hope she loved that. <laughs> You can see in my text where she says that, and then I say like, uh, "That's my favorite E. E. Cummings poem," and then you can see me go. That was insensitive. Immediately after, I was like, no, seriously, was it a car accident? That must have been awful. Like, you did? You <laughs> yeah. did? Oh, you're trying to backpedal. That was a joke, but really, I care a lot. <laughs> Which I do. I mean, she's, nobody wants to be... Ex- but it's, but it's hard to like, care about absolute strangers like that. Do you find it hard to care about strangers? <laughs> if by strangers you mean people that aren't me. <laughs> exactly. Anyone who's not me, I find it very hard to care about anyone who's not me. It is... Uh, <laughs> I do. Now, like, by the way, I think that's good and bad for you that you with someone like that because <laughs> the good is you will get attention when when I you need, need it. it. Yeah. The bad is you won't get much sympathy. Yeah. <laughs> what about my? What about when my rectum is dangling? What damn it! When my I rectum. don't care. I've seen that twenty times a day. My rectum is dangling. Damn it! <laughs> yeah. What about when my rectum is dangling? Yes. Wasn't that a Paul Simon song, "The Dangling Rectum"? Yeah. Paul Simon had the dangling conversation, that great 60s (laughs) rocker. And the dangling conversation. 
<laughs> and the superficial size. I remember we talked about Simon how and much Garfunkel I hate Simon and how Garfunkel. much you fucking hated them. Yeah. And then I met Paul Simon's you son, did. and I was like, please don't listen to my podcast. Oh. Well, I heard that Paul Simon doesn't like his son's music. <laughs> really? He said that. Just said, I'm not into it. <laughs> dick. Dylan also said that about Jacob. Yeah, I heard that when Jacob Dylan told Bob Dylan he wanted to be in a band, Bob took him down to the boxing gym and they they like, suited up. No, you want to be a musician? Bang, bang. <laughs> Imagine if your dad's Bob Dylan. It's like you know how your dad thinks he's always right. <laughs> I know, really. <laughs> oh god, ah, that's got to be just hard. Yeah. How hard would it be if my dad was Bob Dylan? I'd always be like, oh, my God, my dad is here. I, yeah, I know. I love this guy. <laughs> Imagine you're just like so fascinated with – like because you, just, you, you he, <laughs> he doesn't see him much. He just reads about him. Yeah, and he's just – you're just as big a fan as anybody else. You're oh, my just God. A, that's the premise. It's like, oh, my God. Bob Photos dad, of Bob Dylan's clothes. My dad's going to help me with my homework tonight. This is going to be <laughs> fucking – And you never take in any – all right. Now, you got to carry the two here, son. That's a horrible villain. You do a villain? It's so funny. I listen to uh, Theme Time Radio Hour. By the way, this podcast. Theme Time Radio Hour. He had a show on on Sirius XM a couple years ago called Theme Time Radio Hour. Dylan? Yeah, they did 100 episodes. It's great. It's great. I have a mug. Can I? Oh, really? Yeah. I would love it. It was an hour long show that was just music about a subject. And it would be like, tonight's theme is cats. And then they just do songs about cats. They did an episode about cats. Mm-hmm. But a song that was not on it was The Year of the Cat by <laughs> Al Stewart. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. It was late December. Yeah. The sky turned to snow. <laughs> All around the day. The coming rounds. Oh, that's Time Passages by Al Stewart. Time Passages. <laughs> it was late December. The sky turned to snow. But they'd do like old, like obscure yeah. blues songs yeah. and things. Like really fa- and then he would just talk about different kinds of cats. But this show, heavily influenced by Theme Time Radio Hour, and I didn't realize it until I started listening to them again. Like that little uh, middle piece that I do in the middle of the show, uh-huh. right out of Theme Time Radio Hour. Oh, cool. Didn't even realize it. Also, you gave me a couple of Halloween CDs. I do. So it's all very, a part of... That you're a very theme guy. It's all a, a part of guy. my... But I don't have Thanksgiving theme CD. <laughs> <laughs> only so many songs about turkeys. There's and only I'm so one... crazy that each song that I listened to that you gave me, I was like, so where's the Halloween in this? Oh, there it is. <laughs> sure. <laughs> There's only one turkey-themed horror movie that I know of. Mm. Which one? Blood Freak. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't know it. It's about a guy who becomes a gets the head of a turkey. Well, the only song in those CDs that no one knows about was at the end was uh, the song "The Words Get Stuck in My Throat," and that's uh, uh, from the movie War of the Gargantuas. So you really have to know your. Have you seen like a lot, a lot, a lot of obscure horror films? Oh yeah, it's my passion. That's your thing. That, that's that, my passion. Yeah, uh, I love that stuff. I, I'm always like, no. I put them on like Muzak. I'll just put them on in the background. And the thing that's great about them is it has really nothing to do with my work at all. Yes. You know, I write television and like, you know, do you watch New Girl? No. No, you don't. No. You don't. You, you it's don't. my work. I mean, I don't work on New Girl, but right. it's like, I'm just going to dissect it. Right. It would be like, what are you going to do on your night off? I'm going to go to a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, it's because it's, it's my work. Yeah, I got I a Google it. alert. I'm not on this one. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not, it's, it's a, a big one. I haven't been invited to the show, so I'm really excited. It's a festival near the ocean. I definitely want to yeah. be part of not that. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's just pure enjoyment. It's the way other people are into like music or cooking or stuff like that. Like, yeah, no, this is my. I guess for me, this it was, is my time. I guess for me, my dad got me into sports when I was very young. One of my earliest, happiest memories was being on my dad's lap and watching the New York Giants football team play in the snow. And I just thought it was it was so great. And they had a player on the Browns named Nick Eddy. And I would go to my dad. My first ever joke was, Nick Eddy, dad, get it? Nick Eddy. Because his last name was my first name. <laughs> Nick Eddy. <laughs> That's so funny. What are your early And kids? I kept going to my dad, get it? Get it? Nick Eddy. And, that's and why that you... led me to comedy. Like, yeah, I... and, that's, and you still, to this day, end every joke with, get it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I should start get doing it? that. Get it? The get shirts it? are so fresh. 
yet I am saying bad things. Get it? <laughs> that would be fucking funny. See, See blood freak, freak horrifying, horrifying addicted, addicted monster, monster whose thirst, thirst for an addict's blood, blood will lead you to a horror beyond, beyond belief. belief. Blood, blood freak. freak. Did you get that? It said, See blood freak, the horrifying addicted monster whose thirst for an addict's blood will lead you to a horror beyond belief. Blood freak. See, See blood, blood freak, freak horrifying, horrifying addicted, addicted monster whose thirst, thirst for an addict's blood, blood will lead you to a horror beyond, beyond belief. belief. Blood Freak. You would think that when you were recording the narration to the trailer of a movie, speaking clearly would be something of a prerequisite. Well, you're not the people behind Blood Freak. Made in the good God get a haircut year of 1972, Blood Freak tells the story of Herschel, a Vietnam vet who leaves his Bible loving girlfriend when he is tempted to smoke marijuana to which he immediately becomes horribly addicted. Now that he's hooked on hemp, he takes a job, naturally, at a local turkey farm, eating turkeys that have been injected with various hormones. At first, he doesn't want the job of test turkey eater, so the scientists bribe him with more marijuana. Well, as anyone knows, the combination of pot and turkey leads to a violent seizure. And fearing Herschel has died, the turkey growth hormone scientists people do the professional thing by dumping him in a nearby field. But Herschel is not dead. Or is he? We don't know. We just know that he wakes up with the head of a turkey. The rest of his body is fine, but he's got a turkey's head and he has an insatiable lust for the blood of pot smokers. That's right. You have to be stoned if you want Blood Freak to kill you. Finally, Herschel goes to his old Jesus-loving girlfriend and in some sort of sign language turkey clucking patois asks for her help. And after prayer and reflection, she gets two Christian friends to chop off Herschel's head with a machete. Now, Blood Freak may not be the best bird-themed horror film of all time, but it is far and away the finest turkey monster-themed anti-drug film ever made. As for the best bird-themed horror movie ever made, well, that's gonna go, obviously, to The Birds. They're coming! They're coming! And as interesting as a movie that is... The story behind the making of the movie is just as interesting, more so, in fact, because it's actually true. The Birds, directed in 1963 by Alfred Hitchcock, who, a year after Psycho, was at arguably the peak of his power. The film is based on the story by Daphne du Maurier, who had written the stories behind two other Hitchcock films, Jamaica Inn and Rebecca. Now, the story for The Birds was originally published in 1952 in an issue of, of all things, Good Housekeeping magazine. Hitchcock originally wanted the script to be written by psycho screenwriter Joe Stefano, but Hitchcock couldn't get him. Hitchcock originally wanted Grace Kelly to play the lead, but he couldn't get her. His second choice was Anne Bancroft. But even with an astronomical budget of $3.3 million dollars, he couldn't afford her. That's how hot Anne Pangroft was at the time, and this was probably even before she was married to Mel Brooks. That's right. The point is, Alfred Hitchcock could not always get what he wanted. It's important to remember that Hitchcock, although today widely and rightfully regarded as one of cinema's great directors, was at that time derided in polite circles as something of a showman, not really an auteur. The New York Times reviewed Psycho by saying it fell quite flat, but the acting was fine. Sight and Sound magazine, the manual of snooty cineasts, reviewed Vertigo, now considered Hitchcock's masterpiece, by saying it was Hitchcock repeating himself in slow motion. Go fuck myself. This despite the fact that in recent years there's been a push to have Vertigo anointed the greatest film ever made surpassing even Citizen Kane, which had its own trouble with reviewers. Anyway, lacking a leading lady, rebuffed for the umpteenth time by his muse, Grace Kelly, 
Hitchcock cast unknown actress Tippi Hedren after seeing her on the Today Show in a soda commercial. He flew her to Hollywood and began grooming her meticulously to be his new leading lady. And supposedly, as the story goes, much, much more. But Hedren was not having it. And by it, we mean him. And so, during the making of The Birds, Hitchcock began punishing Tippi Hedren for spurning his intentions. This despite the fact that his wife, of nearly four decades, Alma, was also working on the film and was often, if not at his side, in the other room. Hitchcock's behavior culminated during the bird attack near the end of the film, when Tippi Hedren's character, Melanie Daniels, is trapped in a second-floor bedroom full of birds. And so, for five solid days... Tippi Hedren stood there while Alfred Hitchcock pelted her with live birds. He probably had crewmen do it, but there you go. Five days. It wasn't until the very end of the week when a bird gouged her cheek and came a little too close to her eye that Tippi Hedren finally collapsed. A doctor ordered a week's rest and asked Mr. Hitchcock aloud in front of the crew if he was trying to kill her. The resulting scene is phenomenal. The stature of the film The Birds is self-evident, and Tippi Hedren did go on to work with Hitchcock again in the vastly underrated Marnie, which, though good, is no blood freak. Can you imagine what it must be like to be a beautiful blonde woman? I know I do. Now imagine you're a beautiful blonde woman in the back of a chauffeured car and Alfred Hitchcock is thrusting his corpulence upon you in an unelegant attempt at dry humping you into a pulpy oblivion right in your Edith Head pantsuit. That was the kind of close shave Tippi Hedren had to deal with on the set of The Birds. But if you aren't an iceberg blonde and you still want a close shave, you've got to get on down to harrys.com. Harry's was sparked by the personal experience of Andy, one of the founders, that is emblematic of the experience of many guys. Andy's story? I went to a drugstore. I waited 10 minutes for someone to unlock the case where the razors were being held. I bought a four-pack of blades and some shaving cream. It wasn't the best purchase experience, to say the least. And then I walked out and looked into my bag. I had a receipt for over $25. I just felt like there had to be a better way. Harrys.com focuses on providing guys with a great shaving experience for a fraction of the price of their competitors. It's half the price of many other big name blades. They have high quality razor blades engineered in their own factory in Germany for sharpness and strength. Imagine if Christoph Waltz was making your razor blades. They're that good. These blades are half the price of the competitors. They have the convenience and the ease of ordering online. They are shipped to your door for a quality shave at a quality price. So here is our call to action. Go to harrys.com. Use the promo code Dana. That's my name to save $5 off your first purchase. $15 gets you a set that includes a handle, three blades, and shaving cream all shipped to your door in a box. Harry's even offers custom engraving options to engrave your initials on the razor. Now that you've shaved, you may want to invite a young lady over, chill some champagne, dim the lights, and throw on Blood Freak, or better yet, The Birds, or Marnie, or Vertigo, which is the one that gets my vote, or the HBO movie The Girl that tells the story of Alfred Hitchcock's sexual obsession with Tippi Hedren on the set of The Birds. Well, you need a computer. Now tiptoe on down to danagool.com. Click on our Amazon banner. You can shop for those succulent items or anything else from today's broadcast. You get what you want. And without spending a penny more, we get a couple shekels to keep the lights on. Right here at the Dana Gould Hour. Welcome to Political Talk with two guys from Boston, a working man's look at the socio-political issues of our day. And now, Political Talk with two guys from Boston. This is Political Talk with two guys from Boston. I'm Johnny Condon. Robbie Sullivan here. So all the people are complaining about all the snow. Yeah. 
And they're saying, how can there be snow if there's also global warming? Yeah, if it's so warm, where's this coming from? It is because the temperature increase has reduced the veracity of the polar vortex. Wait, what? Which has allowed all of the cold air that was normally held in a band okay, yeah. around the pole okay. to escape Wait. and go down south. Vortex? The fact that there is more snow... Yeah. During global warming, uh-huh. actually makes sense. Really, in the same way. How's that? That nothing will get you laid less than being in a relationship with someone who you sleep in the same bed that, with every night. That makes sense now. It's clear to me. See yeah. how it is? Yeah. No, that makes perfect if sense. If you are in the same bed with the same woman every night, yeah. I can tell you one thing: you're not going to get laid as much. Yeah, because you know why? You're tired. You're tired. You're tired of and it. You, here's here's words that do not begin any romantic novel. He slipped into bed. It was her again. <laughs> well, you know, you think about it, too. You, you got to be present with whatever situation is there. Oh, for God's sake. Well, Here we global go. global warming. No, You've I'm been just watching saying, Kung Fu again. But when you say global warming in front of your father, what does he say? Oh, he just rolls his eyes. Yeah, they don't even believe it that it could yeah. be existing, right? Can you call it climate change? Yeah. Call it whatever you want. All I know is I'm shoveling a lot more than I used to. <laughs> and I'm tired of it. Does he use the Teflon shovel? <laughs> My father still uses a dirt spade on snow. <laughs> just 84. Out of anger. It takes a while, but yeah. geez, it's fun. Just out of anger. I just think that he should have a cocktail and breathe on it, and it'll be fine. Oh, yeah, that's right. When they get that scotch going. <laughs> My, My grandfather used to give us bourbon when we'd be running around in my grandparents' house. It'd be about 6, 7 o'clock. Lawrence Welk is coming on. Sure. He'd just say, come here. And you take a little sip of it, and all of a sudden you start running around, and then you just... Fall to sleep. Well, yeah. When I hear that people, when they take their kids on airplanes, they give them cold medication because it knocks them right out. Oh, Nyquil. Yeah. Why don't yeah. you just inject them with whatever? I think get the stuff that made Michael Jackson go to sleep. You don't want your kid addicted to Nyquil. <laughs> At least alcohol. Nyquil is a, junkies. There's ways to fix it. Nyquil junkies. I don't think lurking any, around yeah, the cold aisle no, of a Walgreens. NA does not stand for Nyquil. I'll tell you that right now. There's no Nyquil meetings. I have had, I have tell you, I have had a couple of hits of NyQuil, and I go right out. Yeah, my my, my father's wife, his uh, second wife, she gave the kids NyQuil. She would just literally be like, I am sick of it. Come here, you guys. NyQuil out. And out they go, down. I they want, weren't sick. I had a cold. I took a sick day. I had a cold. I drank a half a bottle of NyQuil. Jeez. Went to sleep. Woke up in April down in the railroad tracks. <laughs> Johnny, to, no. To find out I had become king of the hobos. <laughs> That's a nice transition. Here's my charity. Do you want to hear about my charity? Yeah. We go into inner cities. We, me, and you? You and me. All right. We go into, we go into the uh, inner city. All right, I'm and we nervous. Get, we get winos off of Skid Row. All right. And we re-release them into their natural habitat. Which is what? The wine country of Northern California. Oh, I didn't even we think of that. We let them run out into the vineyards. Holy it's like, smoke. It's like taking a polar bear out of the zoo and bringing them to the South Pole and letting them roam oh, free. Oh, my God. I think we could rent a bus we, from Perrin's school. We have to get the winos back into the vineyards, their smart. natural habitat. Yeah. And let then them, they're free. What if we got them crushing grapes? And then they have little wino yes. babies. It's self-sufficient hobo country. They have tiny little shopping carts. Yeah. They push around. What if we got them their own country out there? Yeah. They hobo have to go- country. Hobo Slavia. Oh, my. This is smart. Hoboistan. Have you ever been out there to California? I have been out to California. Is it nice? Yeah, it's all right. It's just like Grafton with less lights. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Because, you know, the people that leave, when they go, I'm sort of like, nah, so you're not with us anymore. Yeah, they all. It's 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 not the same. It's like having it's like being an otter and having your belly rubbed. Yeah, I don't think the weather can be that nice for that long. I, and you know what else is like? You gotta get sick of it. If it's sun every day, for God's sakes, I need to change just to remind me to lose weight. It's like the be- <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna get out. Of, I'm gonna have to take this sweater off at some point. Yeah, People otherwise, are gonna see my food, baby. Yeah, otherwise you're just like, oh, it's summer forever. Well, it's like yeah, you can't listen to the Beach Boys every day. Occasionally, I need to listen to something grim. Yeah, good vibration, sure, for a long time, but eventually you're gonna get to Elliot Smith. Yeah, eventually I gotta put on some nine inch nails. You and just have be ang- to. I just want to be angry sometimes. Yeah, that's why it's all coming out of Seattle with the sub pop people. I, they're all depressed, and their music is lovely. They're five year old, and they're already drinking coffee and yeah. smoking cigarettes. You all have day. to there because it's, it's gonna be good rain. music. No, they have a Starbucks child cup. They do. Yeah, in <laughs> Seattle only, but it's nice. You give your little kid five. It's about five ounces. It's a shot of espresso uh-huh. with a little bit of. Um, 
chocolate milk. For, and they, really? Yeah. And they had, they get on that big wheel and they just burn oh, plastic. They are happy and content and you don't see them all day. Yeah. Gone. Remember that? When we were kids under the street with our big You'd wheels? You'd be gone. I'll see you at dinner. I wonder, yeah, the problem with kids and coffee is they start thinking too much. You get five, six-year-old kids walking around going, is this it? <laughs> That's totally where I'm at. Seven more decades yeah. and then what? Yeah. And I'm, that's it, Ricky. <laughs> you know, I'm coming up on uh, my fifth here, and I can't help but think, is this it? I would, if I ever gave the uh, inauguration speech at a university, I would yeah. just sit and think, well, I don't know what the fuck you guys think is coming. <laughs> the only thing I can tell you for sure is you're going to take those stupid fucking hats off. Yeah. And in about five years, you're going to have a 10 yard stare, and we're going to be laughing our ass <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, I hope college served you well spending all that money on a, on a career when, when you come out of college, all the careers you study for are gone. They're all gone. They're all, there's all new jobs. What Unless, do you do? I think you need a, a, a broad education in mm-hmm. high school to prepare you for life. I don't think college is important. I would like to know at what point in someone's maturity yeah. do they go from hypnotist yeah. to anesthesiologist? <laughs> to me, they're the same uh, kind of people. Well, it's that same thing about One, when you're a Democrat. They say if you're, if you're 20 years old and you don't have the compassion and sympathy to be a Democrat, you're a mm-hmm. cold person. But if you get to 50 and you're still a Democrat, you're, you're your an mind. idiot. Well, I'm an idiot. Right. I can't help it. Maybe I'm just immature. Why does somebody love become people. a hypnotist and somebody become an anesthesiologist? I think it's a transition between yeah, it's a two weird, periods yeah, of life. It's, it's the same reason like some people die, they become back as ghosts. Other people come <laughs> back as zombies. They, it's a weird choice. Hey, have you found on, on The Walking Dead that the, the zombies are becoming more fragile? Like they used to be harder to kill and now they're like Cheetos. <laughs> Well, you know, perhaps people are whipping. You, know, you hit them with a shoelace, <laughs> and their head bisects. Maybe after they killed so many of them, they get like their their, their DNA is like. I can't believe I'm discussing this as if it's real. Well, it is. Well, it oh, might it as well real. be. Yeah, it's, it's like the stormtroopers in Star Wars. They were scary in the first movie, and then yeah. the teddy bears are killing them. Oh, the right, right. And the next time, you're oh, like, and now there's what? a black stormtrooper, and everybody's <laughs> up in arms. <laughs> Because he must be bad because he's black. I bet the minute Darren Wilson saw that trailer, he went for his gun. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> oh, let's talk about him for a minute. Oh, that would, imagine if that happened in Boston, the different reaction it'd be, it would get. Well, in Boston, it would just be Darren Wilson Day the next day. And we'd yeah. Have a parade. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the thing about Boston, too, is I think there'd be people with a shirt on, like when there was when Archie Bunker was like sure. a big hit. And they'd be like, Archie's ah, right. Sure. I remember seeing that shirt and being absolutely frightened of that person that has the Archie's right shirt on. Like, oh, my God. Well, growing up with my father, watching Archie Bunker was like, who's this pussy? <laughs> Dude, your dad is like the hardcore Archie. He's like, he's like Archie with, a, with a, a suit of armor on. Exactly. Archie Bunker is the Leo Biscalia version of my father. <laughs> That's really good. The only good thing about the midterm elections being over is that Ebola went away. Oh, yeah. It was everybody's biggest concern until November 4th, and yeah. then it went away. Yeah. My friend thought he had it, but he just was had eaten at the Cheesecake Factory. I just think Ebola is God's way of saying your organs haven't turned into liquid shit enough yet. <laughs> well, you know what's funny about disease? Oh, wait. <laughs> Nothing. It's it fucking com- kills me. They're all coming. It kills me. Because you know what happens is I, I can't even watch that show House. Remember that show? Sure. I couldn't watch it because I, I feel like I don't know what these things are. I don't want to know. If I talk about them, I'm going to get them. Sure. I don't want a left cybristic frosis magnilium on, gaga on house, in my every, fucking arm. Every episode of House with Guillaume Barre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't deal. I don't even know. I, for some reason, anything to do with medicine, I'm out. I don't I want don't, blood. I don't want fucking disease. I don't want operations. I'm out. I'm out. How long was that show on? Seven years? Too long. Grow a fucking beard or shave. Yeah, do something. Uh, the, 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 Which the, is it? The studious, the studious. Whenever I see a guy at the Academy Awards that doesn't have a beard but hasn't shaved, yeah. I'm like, really? You buy a fucking tux but you didn't have time to shave? <laughs> Shit, I'll get off the fucking pot. You know, I was going to ask you about this yesterday, Johnny. Have you seen this Rosetta Stone commercial where they got this guy and he's in the beginning of it he's he's like just a tiny bit a little bit of scruff because right. he's going to learn the language oh, then Jesus. they cut to him with the worst glued on beard <laughs> the Gandalf you have beard ever seen in your whole <laughs> life and now he's like studying it and right. then he's completely clean shaven and now there's someone coming from like Japan to visit his family and oh, he's like Jesus. you know yoki moki moki whatever excuse me Japan people that ain't good but I'm just that saying crazy Japan whatever he says mo- the moki moki language which I is think it? which I think means nice to see you nice or whatever you. Yeah. but moki 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 and they're both what looking at each other lovely, oh isn't it fun that we both know the language and I no longer 
longer have the glue on my face from the beard. But the beard is it it's like I haven't seen it. It sounds like a Building 19 commercial. It is. It's like that, or, or like a Burlington Coat Factory, or one of them, <laughs> where they're like, you know, they they turn to their right and to suggest something, but it's not there. But they don't have the time to re-edit, so they just leave it. Now, do you still? You get you, when are you doing your shopping? Yeah. Wait, are what? you doing your shopping? Your Christmas shopping? Oh God, you know me. I can't do. I, I got to wait till the end. Here's what I do. I check with my, my sister about uh-huh. what she got her kids because I got right. nephews and nieces and find out. Because I've shown up before and I'm like, yeah, you know what I got them? They're like, we already have that on the tree. Right. Oh, well, I'm screwed. So I wait until about the 22nd and check in about those gifts. I buy my mother something early on sale because she can't get a gift that's not on sale. She's going to ask you, what did right. you pay for this? How much? Yeah, because she wants to return it and sure. get four of them. Because sure. that's the way my mother works. Everything's a trade in. It's understand. all trading up and everything. So, you know, I, I, she's very concerned about the collapse of society. And exactly. She wants to have more than one toaster oven in case it goes. <laughs> you have to. Like, there'll be power. Yeah, my mother does. She's got like a coffee grinder. It's still in the box for when the other one breaks. So you don't sure. got to go make the trip. Right. I like that, that with shoes. I buy, I find a pair. I like them. I bought some Herman Survivors. I said, Give me two because I don't want to shop for another two years. Oh, yeah. And then you're all set when they, right. break, when they break down. Or are you one of those people that goes back and forth between the two pairs? No. No. I wear one down, and I, I do. just like women. Yeah. I get them. <laughs> I get them till they're falling apart, and I get a new pair. And then you get a retread. Doesn't realize it's sick of me yet. <laughs> now, do you get a retread or a whole new pair? Oh, I get a retread. Well, you know, shoes, I get whole new pairs. Women they, with me, it's all retread. They say you can spend, that you can spend, a, you could have a thousand different relationships with a thousand different women, sure. or... You could have a thousand different relationships with the same woman. When you're when you're single and you're my age, you enter the world of the pre bitter, which is the, the <laughs> you get they're already bitter. Oh it's yeah, it's already. I'd like to go to a movie tonight. Well, now we know they're going to be living your life. <laughs> <laughs> you can't well, leave it. You know, it's like, like what know, do you want to do? Here's yeah. the, here's the never. What do you want to do tonight? Okay, you're not making plans, which means you're not paying attention to me because I want you to make plans. Yeah. Or you go the other way. Here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to go to Sabatini. And yeah. we're gonna, oh, really, master? Is there anything else I should be doing? You cannot win. Well, I lost my last girlfriend because I would take her out every time we did something. You know, every time I'd call her, I'd say, oh, let's go to dinner. Oh, let's go do this. Let's do that. And then finally we became boyfriend and girlfriend, yep. and I had her. Yeah. So I'm at her house where I'm at my house. I don't want to do anything else. It's all done. I'm like, I've been working all day I with you. I just want to sit. I just want to sit there with yeah. you and watch something about, uh, you know, the – the trash pickers or whatever. Yeah, what, uh, yeah. Just some mindless Just me, thing I watch that I don't have some... to think about yeah. and you're not mad at me for. Right. You know, I don't want to see a romantic comedy. Good fucking Ever luck. watch a romantic comedy and halfway in and she's in the bathroom crying? Well, they're always like, how come we're not what like What the hell that? did I do? No, yeah. it's not what you did. It's what he did. It's like what you did a year ago and you don't remember, but she's got a Rolodex of hate. Well, all of those, and plus all those goddamn movies, pick up the fucking movie yeah. a month later when Jeez. they hate each other. I know, exactly. You know? And Seattle Harry hated it, yeah. Sally, never yeah. came out. They don't meet it later when yeah. Harry, Dutch oven, Sally thought it was funny and Sally cried and stayed at their mother's house for Right, three you've weeks. got mail, it's a Dear John letter, Jesus didn't come out Christ. yet. There's a lot of them out there, though. And here's another thing about the end of fucking Titanic. That yeah. door was big enough that he could have hung on to a part of it. That's a good point, never even thought of that. Yeah. You know, he probably should have hung on to that for a while longer because that's his biggest hit, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I Here's know. something else. All those movies that where the guy dies at the end or the yeah. girl dies at the end, yeah. the first thing that happens after you die is your bowels empty. Really? So all those movies are like, I love you forever. Oh, that's a really good point. So yeah. you see the head drop, and what you yeah. don't think is what else is dropping. Chili. Yeah, he's dropping a yeah. few friends at the, the lake The end of right Titanic then. should have been, he slips below the surface, she starts crying, and then bubbles. <laughs> A zag nut. Oh, wait. Oh, Lord. That's Somebody not a zag a nut, pa. <laughs> wait a minute. I'm Johnny Condon. And you know who I am. Robbie Sullivan. This has been Political Talk with Two Guys from Boston. We're cool if you are cool. Political Talk with Two Guys from Boston. Hey there. Just wanted to say that we saw you at L.A. Park Fest this year. You were fucking wicked funny. Thank you for the t-shirt. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you next year, you fucking cocksuckers. When you were talking about Bob Kane, you said he was the Walter Keene of comics. Uh-huh. For those of you who don't know who Walter Keene is. Walter Keene. Uh, Walter Keene is kind of the guy who invented uh, the mass marketing of art. He was, uh, he was a painter. and Actually, he wasn't a painter, but everyone thought he was a painter. He, and his work was not accepted in art circles. 
So he kind of did this crazy end run where he figured out how to make prints really cheap and sort of doing his posters, and he, and he built his own gallery, and he made his own coffee table books. But the story of the Keens is that Walter actually couldn't paint at all. Uh, he couldn't. He could barely hold a brush, and all the paintings that are identified as Walter Keene's paintings, the sort of iconic big-eyed children of the late fifties and sixties. Right. People have um, to remember. Yeah. Every time you go to your aunt's house, and there is exactly. a creepy painting right. of a sad child with ginormous right. eyes. Well, they were they were actually all painted by uh, his wife Margaret, who was sort of locked up in the in the attic of the house and just cranking out one painting after another. And the the eyes are sad and crying because she was living a very painful life. But he was a genius at marketing. He was right. totally a guy who I don't think also when he initially took credit for it thought it was going to become the most successful art in the 1960s. I mean, these guys were making so much money at a certain point. But it was one of those things where he was a bit of a, a bon vivant, a little bit of a life of the party. Big, yeah. uh, he was a he salesman. Was a salesman yeah. He was a salesman. And uh, when he, uh, you know, he couldn't get in the gallery, so he put these paintings up at the Hungry Eye nightclub. He actually rented the walls from Enrico Banducci, who used to run that nightclub. In San Francisco. In San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And uh, it started to take off, and he just found that when... He was there at the nightclub. If he said he was the painter, he could get a little bit more money for the art. And uh-huh. when the wa- he didn't tell the wife this, but when the wife found out about it, she said, no, you can't do this. But he sort of did it anyway. Right. And at a certain point, it was like, we now have $5,000. And and it became, you know, you can almost, it's a slippery slope. You can say, oh, well, he does it at the nightclub, but then slowly it becomes a newspaper, and then it becomes bigger and bigger, and now they're opening a gallery, and now she's complicit in the lie. Right. she's had to go along with it. And it just makes her life kind of a living hell for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. And they were huge. They were huge. What's funny, I just came from uh, being with Tim Burton, who directed the movie, um, and they were asking him about you know his influences and things like this, and he was like, he said, I grew up in Burbank, you know, not from a family that didn't have art books and things. This is what right. was art to me. Like I would go to my grandma's house and there'd be a Keen painting. I'd go to the dentist's office, there'd be a Keen painting. You <laughs> right. know, so this is what I'm from Indiana. So I, even though I'm a, a little, you know, I was I was born in '61, so it was kind of peaking as I was a little kid, but that still was around all the time. I was born in '64 and I'm from Massachusetts, but right. they were still on, yeah. omnipresent yeah. because people had them in their homes. You know, people would buy art and. Working class people, they'd buy a painting in yeah. 1961, and it would stay on the walls for 20 Absolutely. years. Absolutely, I grew up. My parents would never have Walter Keene on the wall or in the house or anything. I wasn't aware of him except when I would go to dentist's office and whatnot. Yeah. And then what you'd see is also Walter Keene wannabes. Correct. You yeah, know, like Correct. imitations, and I couldn't tell the difference. Right. There well, you know, you can tell the difference, which is kind of interesting because a lot of people have been asking us over the years, like, do you think she's a good artist? And uh, because there's so um, there are people who really hate her art, there are people who really like her art, but. There's something about a real Margaret Keene that is different than those knockoffs. Those knockoffs, they all have big eyes with their little berets or whatever. Mm. Uh, but there's a deadness to the eyes. You can yeah. tell that there's, there's a soulfulness <laughs> to Margaret's painting. There is something in there, and whether it's, it's folk art or whatever <laughs> that, yeah. that Jerry Lewis picked up on. <laughs> yes, and, exactly. that, and Natalie Wood. And uh, yeah, no, that's they, a, they, <laughs> I first heard about Mar- there, there was a person called Margaret Keene. Was when uh, my friend Glenn Bray sent me a book, Margaret Keene. You know, right. at the same time, the Walter Keene. I, I had no idea there was a Margaret Keene, right. but the work was beautiful, technically beautiful, and the Jerry Lewis p- portrait was in there with the Harlequin, right. Harlequin costumes. And she, made, she made, uh, he made them do it twice. I know that, he, yeah. he, She painted it once, and then he wanted the Harlequin outfit, so <laughs> then she painted it again. Where is that painting now, do you know? I believe the Lewis family, the Lewis family must still have it. Uh, well, who, Does he have oh, the big Pat, Would Patty it? have it? Or, I would assume Jerry, so. Jerry, That's like, funny, I never try to track it down. That's I don't think Jerry even gets along with most of you yeah, know, his true, kids in true. that picture <laughs> anymore. I find that hard to believe. I think he Disowned several of them. <laughs> she actually, I believe, she painted that at a hotel in Beverly Hills. Where right. there was there, I think, the Beverly Hills Hotel, and uh, it was supposed to be one kid came in at a time. Uh, uh, and what happened was, after the first hour, uh, they just were there all the time, and dogs were running. Is that in scene and out. in the movie? Uh, no. No, because then you'd have to hire someone to imitate Jerry. Well, you get they, Sammy Petrillo, you know. <laughs> it's easy. He I, I couldn't do that back. anymore. He could come back. Um, we totally refer to the fact that at a certain point, well, one of the things, Walter's genius is that he realized that art critics didn't really matter. Mm. What was important were celebrities. And so he would always find out when any celebrity was up in San Francisco. Mm. So if Joan Crawford was eating at the Purple Onion, he would show up with a painting of Joan Crawford and be, you know, Miss Crawford, I we 
you know, yeah. we bestow this to you uh, in honor of your cinematic mm. art. And you would take, the, there'd be a picture. Mm. And all of a sudden, that'd be in a newspaper the next day. And then people would be like, oh my God, I want to have paintings just like Joan yeah. Crawford does. Wow. Joan Crawford loved to paint. Joan Crawford put, I there's know, two of them in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. And then she, it's on the cover wow. of her autobiography. Uh-huh. Now, the Joan Crawford, Jerry Lewis paintings, they don't have big eyes. No, they don't. Well, here's the thing. It became very awkward at a certain point in the Keynes' uh, lifespan that Walter could not pay. But, but the fact that publicly, Margaret was the person who was supposed to just be the housewife. Right. And so, and she was actually the one doing the creation. So, oh, he didn't give her any credit. They never, zero. Like, we did this together. Zero. And what right. happened was she became so worked up about this that she wound up creating a second style, mm. a second style of painting so they could be a painting couple. So there's a whole separate style of, they're called MDHs because she uses her, her initials, sort of Modigliani kind of women, these, these skinny mm-hmm. women. And they're very, they, I actually think those paintings are beautiful. Yeah, and they actually, are. Because here's the thing, the Keen paintings at a certain point became commerce. The Keen paintings became like, you have to produce 10 Keen paintings this week and you know, right. put, keep the business running. Where the MDHs, because they weren't as popular, it really became... This is how I'm expressing myself. Mm-hmm. And if you look back at those, some of those paintings, they're, they're nakedly, it's a woman bursting out of a frame. It's a woman torn in half. Mm-hmm. You, just, you, know, mm-hmm. you, just, you can mm-hmm. read so much into these paintings. They weren't big eyes. They were soulful eyes. Yes. I remember that yeah. about her work. Here's right. an interesting thing, just the way things spin about on each other. Mm-hmm. The pilot of the night gallery that you just mentioned, directed by Steven Spielberg, yeah. who is the subject of one of these contract negotiations where there is a man who has a contract that Steven Spielberg, he was his manager, and Steven claims he signed it when he was 17, not 18. And and there's Mm. a dispute about Steven Spielberg's real age specifically because of the legality Mm. of this contract and that Steven supposedly still owes this guy a movie. Mm. This gentleman lives to sue Steven Spielberg. He directed the pilot of the Night Gallery, which is called Eyes, which features Joan Crawford having a portrait done of herself. Mm-hmm. It all folds in Crazy. together. And Tom Bosley was in that episode too. I believe he I was. That, yeah. <laughs> Who he gave up his eyes for Joan Crawford. That's right. For 24 oh, hours. Oh wow! Yes. And of course they have the blackout. Yes. I'm giving it away. At the end. Yeah. Oh. The, the New York blackout occurs. So she has the eyes during the She's, blackout. She gets yeah. Tom Bosley's eyes. She can finally see, and the blackout hits that second. Yeah. Everything goes black. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can still see things. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, no, yeah, you would think, yeah. No, just she look. thought that it didn't work. <laughs> right, it didn't work. Oh. And she starts bitching, and then, of course, she just, like, pushes the window, goes out a window, and she's yeah. dead, and that's the end of that. She should have just yeah. went out and rioted. <laughs> and the know? other one... <laughs> you would think, like, if she gets some... Yeah, like a uh, flashlight might have been around. And she the other just, one was... Just test it. Yeah. I believe in that, probably. The other one was the painting... Of because they were all painting. Yeah, that was the gimmick of the show. Yeah, yeah. Roddy McDowell gets the house from his <laughs> uncle, right. and there's the painting, and then you see the uncle on the painting That's get right. up out of the grave and continue to walk exactly. towards the house. Well done. That was the and first one. I used to live in Roddy McDowell's house. Wow. wow. Ozzie Davis was in that episode as, as Portafoy's butler. Yes. Portafoy. 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 <laughs> it was so strange. Not Why quite he... out of the closet yet, but, yes. but you know, maybe indicating a, a something there. I thought Portafoy. it would be wonderful if Andy Serkis's depiction of Caesar in the New Apes films, if they still had this Ryder McDowell's voice, if he was still like photorealistic chimp with this fey British, Caesar is home. Like he's still... <laughs> <laughs> that, that, <laughs> now, I have to get back to the Ryder McDowell story that I think yeah. you're thinking Supposedly about. he could blow himself. Yeah, and he, he would do it can. at parties in front of Elizabeth Taylor and yeah. Rock Hudson and, well, groups, a... and Lawrence Harvey and groups of people. It's not true. He wasn't the Ron Jeremy of his day. No, our friend Brian Peck. Yes. First time I ever met you was at Brian Peck's house, oh, wow. I believe. Okay. Was very close friends with Roddy. Mm-hmm. I met Roddy at Brian's house the same night. But you met Roddy, older Roddy. Older maybe, Roddy. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, that might have been a phase. Well, like, no, you, know, like, no, you can only reach out a certain... Yeah, you got to stop that at some point. Exactly. Well, yeah, this, is the, this is what Brian Peck told me. But if you do it three times a day, maybe you never... Maybe it's like maybe. a yoga thing. It's possible, like, you, yeah. but you know, when he got in his 70s, you know, yeah. I just want to go to a party and relax. <laughs> can I just... You know, everybody wants me to do but it. you can it's suck like, your own dick yeah. while you go to the party. Yeah. It's like, that's why they had him. But, you know, he's a charming guy, I'm sure, and he had a lot of great stories. It would explain why his contract writer was all just a tray of banaca. 
<laughs> but no, he uh, Brian asked Roddy, "Is it true?" And Roddy said, "Oh, I wish." Uh, uh, well, that's a good answer. So, yeah. You know, I get that too about Danny Thomas. Is it true? And yeah. I, of course, I wasn't there. You yeah, know, you hear different things. Right. Some people swear, no, it's not true at all. But other people say, yes, it's completely true. Milton Berle did have a huge. Well, that has, of course, been confirmed. Yeah, although there are no photos of it. No, you know? but Paul Provenza. Saw it. Valerie Brayman has seen it, yeah, yeah. who directed yeah. Milton Burrow's last film and Adam Sandler's first. Uh-huh. And Alan Zweibel has seen it and discussed it. Basically, they set up a table and Milton like plopped it on the table to show everybody when he was doing Saturday Night Live. So it's all been confirmed. Yeah. And Milton was proud of it, too. Yeah. Even though he would act like, oh, let's talk about something else. But, you know, he'd always get the topic back to his penis, his yeah. schlong, his yeah. schwanz. I would think that at a certain point would be a pain you know he's like this legendary comedian this legendary career for 60 70 years and that's all anybody talks about yeah. no, that's all, no, that's all, that's all that. you talk about no, like, I'm, I'm sorry. most people don't like people you know yeah. Mark you Mar- don't hear a lot on, on radio classics that was of course big dick milton <laughs> burrow <laughs> and we're coming up with shit in the coffee table Danny thomas right. next it's like it's, you live in this very closed universe where that's I, I, all I that to matters. me that's all people when i you know on on facebook and on you know, people I, I sure. see. That's what they want to talk right. about. So I guess it's it's they kind seek of a, you out. a closed world. They well, know what, they know what I you assume like. Everybody, but Mark right. Maron asked me yesterday. He said, "Why would you be interested in Milton Berle at this point?" I said, "I'm interested in people nobody else gives a shit about." Right? Anymore. No, and that is. I mean, here's the thing. To me, that was when I first met you and we became friends. You were the guy. You and your brother just. I think one of the first people to do kind of what Scott and I do now too, where you just pick those people who are on the fringe of show business. Well, people, nobody, like I said, nobody gives a shit. About right. It, but, and yeah. we always joke that we write biographies of people who don't deserve biographies. Oh, right. But you were able to capture this kind of pop culture thing. And to me, it was like those people were so much more interesting than people who wrote these big books. And, yeah, and, you know, I agree. And so like, I was so fascinated. And, and the fact that you, you showed these characters in ways that you can – just simply Fred Murch's Night Out or Andy Griffin with the, with the we gas station. We didn't even think about that when we were doing those early fe- comics. Yeah, but Fred, it felt- Murch's, Fred Murch's Night Out has one of the particular twists in that story. And I really remember specifically thinking like, yeah, the, the, I'm on this frequency. Right, these guys, and, and, and the thing was, it also made it's sense. We were like, right, dead that is what that is, that is what the real the Fred, that's what company. the real Fred Mertz would do. Well, it was you know, and it, know. Fred Mertz was a guy who ran a building. This is what the real Fred Mertz would do, it's and it also like, made yeah. me say, wait, you can look at all these pop culture guys this way. And uh, you know, when we started uh, thinking <laughs> about the Ed Wood story, but it was great because uh, you had done the cards. To us, those characters felt legendary already. That you know, we could mm. we acted like ah oh, that you know, Doctor Tom Mason was a character that people would love because well, yeah. I was doing those cards. Yeah. I was I was even thinking when I was drawing those Ed Wood players cards. I was thinking yeah. these guys in their careers, if they had careers, considered careers, would never have assumed they'd be on a bubblegum card or right. yeah. you know, be captured that way. And, right. and that was on my mind. Like, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to put them on cards and but, pay yeah. tribute to them that way. Right. It's really wonderful. And who is the gentleman? He was a very popular character actor. That played the general in Plan 9 that had not just oh. a town, but a town of people. Because mm. he was just on Perry not, not, Mason. Not like, Lyle Talbot. No. Yeah, Lyle Talbot. Okay. Oh, right. He was on Perry Mason like three nights Respectable ago. actor. Yeah, and he actually, like with real dialogue, he actually does a real the, nice the, job. We're, we're doing all these. on Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah, he was on Ozzy and Harriet? Yeah, he was the neighbor, uh, uh, Joe something yeah, on Ozzy and Harriet for, for, for yeah. over a decade. Yeah, like a respectable guy. Ricky Nelson and, and Lyle Talbot. Right. We're regular. There's a lot of Perry Mason and Big Eyes right now. Oh no! Yes, so you'll be if That's you my, like Perry Mason, new, you'll nice. you'll like you It's like, my newest yeah. obsession. All right. It's my current uh, video comfort food as right. I watch. Did you Perry read the Mason. biography of Raymond Burr that came out a couple of years ago? No, but no, I you gotta I read will that. now. A lot of stuff about him in Hawaii and what went on there. Yeah, Paul Lynn it wasn't just him, Jim Neighbors. Paul Lynn <laughs> called him the Iron Duchess, which I just <laughs> think is. You gotta say it like Paul Lynn. The Iron Duchess. But also, when you watch those shows, and I didn't say this originally someone said it to me but it's like maybe perry mason is where david byrne got the idea for the big suit oh wow those, uh, those uh, suits are mad. That's funny. now here's an interesting thing tom kenny mentioned about that <laughs> raymond burr closeted gay man in hollywood in the 1950s acting every day with the son of hedda hopper paul drake was hedda hopper's mm-hmm. son wow. 
Small world. I talk about like playing close that, to the fire uh, unless had a hopper new. It all, all comes home because there's a scene in uh, Money from Home with Martin and Lewis the, where Tor Johnson is on the plane with, uh, with Raymond Burr. And there's a, it didn't make the film, actually. It was cut out of the film, but I have a still of it. Oh, wow. You know, so everything like kind of like it is six Not de- quite a big boy. Six oh, degrees hey. of Tor Johnson. <laughs> now, the, uh, <laughs> the, the third act of our movie is uh, Margaret and Walter uh, sue each other. And it goes to court, and Walter ends up acting as his own attorney. It's actually based on a real court case that happened in Hawaii, where Walter wound up. He initially thought that he was going to be represented by the uh, guys who were representing the newspaper. That also was a part of the lawsuit. And the newspaper was charged with libel. He was charged with slander. And the newspaper managed to get off the libel charges almost instantly. And so Walter was there without counsel, and he was didn't want to go just go get a Hawaiian lawyer. So he decided to represent himself. But get me it, a Hawaiian lawyer. Yeah, uh, but it was one of those things where he. Um, uh, uh, the only thing he knew about being a lawyer was from watching Perry Mason mm-hmm. on TV. Mm-hmm. So, so th- then the transcripts were insane. I mean, we actually it, it feels broad in the movie, but it actually we toned it down. Because, well, that's because he actually the did the thing, thing where he would call himself to the stand mm-hmm. and interrogate. Uh, <laughs> You know, and so you you read these things, you're like, like oh my sitcom. god, wow. yeah, like a sitcom. Wow. And the judge at a certain point was saying, you know, give me duct tape to duct tape this guy's mouth. Oh, wow. And so we actually brought it down, but it still play. It's very, it's a really funny yeah. sequence in the film. Speaking, of- Scott and Larry sent me this screenplay a couple of years ago to read, and it was like the greatest thing I ever read. I said, this has to be made. You know, I'm so happy it's finally coming out. I am too. I can't wait. Did you want to make a documentary about your dad? Did you want to make a documentary about the specific the wrecking the record? Crew. What led you to actually go, I'm going to make a film about well, my dad? Well, in 1996, my dad was diagnosed with cancer, and they gave him a year to live. And uh, I wanted to always tell the story about my dad and his friends because it had never been told. And, you know, these guys were going from session to session in the 60s, you know, three, four times a day, and no one knew it was the same guys going around and around. And the reason they were used that way was because the record companies, they, they only had mono. They only had one track at the time. So they couldn't, my dad in 1960s, 30, Hal's 31. They're all adults. Right. You can't trust a teenage man to go in there and knock this stuff out in three hours. So these guys could go in and do three or four songs in, in that period. So when dad got sick, I wanted to always tell a story and I knew I didn't have much time. And, um, you know, my biggest regret was going to be if I didn't do it was not if I didn't do it, I would go, oh, my God, I should have. And I didn't want that. So I started filming. I quickly, you know, got my friends. We had two cameras, two film cameras, which, oh, God, what a waste. Now I look back. <laughs> but <laughs> two film cameras, two dollies. And I'm running around on a, you know, I had four of them at a table. I had Hal Blaine, who's the great drummer, Plas Johnson, who was one of the wonderful sax man who Pink Panther theme. Oh, wow. And uh, Carol Kay, the bass player. And I just started talking to all four of them. Let them talk. I didn't talk. I wanted yeah. to be a voyeur. I kind of based it on Broadway Danny Rose and Diner. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, okay, great. You know I mean? Yeah, Where they sure, just yeah. Let them just... Because musicians are like comedians. And they're like... They just one up on each other, right? Mm-hmm. They just want to nail you, you know. He, I bet nuns are the same way. Oh, just sure. In their own behind bed. closed doors. Yeah, great. That's my next doc. <laughs> <laughs> behind closed doors, we'll call yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so then, I basically, I started doing. Then, Dad unfortunately passed in '97, but I started building on this and did a 14 minute piece. I got uh, Cher involved. You know, she did an interview with her, Nancy Sinatra, Dick Clark, uh, pre-stroke Dick. Uh-huh. Um, and you, I just, said, you just said stroke dick. Um, so, <laughs> he, he's also passed. Yeah. You know, right. So that was 96. So 2006, my wife, uh, Susie, was concerned with just made the most expensive home movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And she's, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, so we basically kept doing what I've done all forever is the credit cards and the refi and all that shit. And then finally we just made a film in 2008. Got it to the film festivals, did really well, extremely well, and a lot of awards and stuff and reviews from Elvis Costello, Peter yeah. Frampton, everybody's flipping out, but no one would pick the damn film up. And they said, because the music, there's a whole, over 100, there's 110 songs in it. And they said, you'll never get the record companies to agree upon a good price. So I did get the record companies to agree, but they still didn't want to pick it up because it was a music doc, you know. 
There was in 2009, there was an article in Variety that was about the struggle of music documentaries and their directors. There's Scorsese talking, you know, they were talking about Scorsese with the Stones doc and Demi with the Neil Young doc and this other director named Denny Tedesco with the Wrecking Crew doc. And I went, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> struggling director. <laughs> they called me director. So That's amazing. Uh, and, but, and, we're, but, and now... So then it- what he just ended up doing is just... Pre uh, crowdfunding, we just started asking for donations. People would donate a thousand dollars to dedicate a song. People would donate five dollars, and they just kept going on and on. And we raised over five hundred thousand. You know, until until last week, you know, it wasn't until last week that Magnolia Pictures signed off on it. Just you know? last week, yeah. Jeez. So is it going to get a theatrical? Yeah, release? theatrical in March, and then uh, they'll do VOD theatrical, and then go to DVD. And uh, it's been fun showing this film, you know. It's, well, everyone knows about it. Like yeah. in L.A., certainly everyone knows about it. Yeah, and it is. It's a really great film. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it, it's incredibly the music watchable. Is, is to very, watch the fir- to watch the first five minutes is to watch the whole movie. You can't once it starts like yeah. you can't stop watching. Yeah, and that's the greatest thing. <clears throat> the greatest compliment I usually get is when it's from a wife or girlfriend of a musician. On the you know when they bring them to the screen, it's like oh god, we're gonna go see a music doc, right? Mm-hmm. You know and they come up to you later and say oh that's so great, I did not want to come, thank you. You know it's like uh, but it's I easy. get that after shows a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's the greatest compliment. <laughs> Even she thought come. you were funny. Thank you. Yeah. I like to. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for ending. There's all these guys working on some of the biggest songs in the world, yeah. and no one really knows. And does that, like, did you notice anything about your dad or any of the guys you talked to that, like, did they Bitterness? seem... Yeah. No. No, um, no, not really at all, because here's the thing is my dad always said, he said, listen, I, you know, I went to work. He says, you know, I got paid. I got my $25. I made hundreds of hits, but I made thousands of bombs. I never gave the guy back his $25. Yeah. You know, there's no reason to. So he, this isn't the story of, oh, those poor musicians got screwed. This is actually the opposite. And part of it is because they were a union town, they were very strict, you know, sometimes too strict maybe, but, but these guys now get payments. I, the, my last Kickstarter was to pay off 200000 that went to the musicians. Oh, wow. So that, that, that was actually quite cool for me to actually know they're calling me and say, what's this for? Well, you got paid for the film. Oh, wow. But no, but those guys, you know, they went, they didn't know what they were doing. It, it's almost like you guys, as writers, you do it all the time. There's nothing you... How many times you have to leave the ego at the door? Yeah. That's part of your job. And I don't know about Dana, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I mean? It's like, that's why I will always, you know, you do it because you love it mm-hmm. first, but then you have to, you know, unless you're doing your own album or your own show, you know, you have to bend. Yes. That's a hard lesson to learn, I think, for a lot of people. And probably the younger ones are worse. Well, yeah, because you don't realize, I think, when you you just, Mm -hmm. yeah, true. When you start out, you don't realize, you think that everything you're doing is the first time anyone's done it. Mm -hmm. It's like what Scott and Larry were talking about, about, you know, big eyes. Uh, It took them 10 years. To I get it made, on ten years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking out of it's here. It's not now. even about their dad. <laughs> yeah, um, eighteen years. Yeah, no, yeah. Ten, it's hard. It's good that they held in there. Yeah, and then eventually, like after ten years, things line up, and then like, uh, yeah, Tim Burton's gonna do it. Awesome. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> is that the first time they've collaborated with him since Ed Wood? This is the first movie that they've written that he directed since Ed Wood. Yeah. Are they happy about it? A lot, yeah, oh, okay. they're really, really happy with it. And uh, it's a fascinating story, you know, it's, uh, it, and, and it's just one of those, you know, a fake story wouldn't be as interesting. The great thing about Scott and Larry is that they get these stories made into movies. It's like Ed Wood. It's like, they made a movie about Ed Wood. Yeah. And it didn't, <laughs> and it didn't suck. Yeah. You know, yeah. They made, you know, they're making a movie about Walter and Margaret Keene. It's like, <laughs> it's crazy. And to your movie about like the Wrecking Crew, it's just like, it, somebody has to just do it and... Lead, as Francis Ford Coppola said, if you start off at one side of town by yourself and you march down the street, by the time you get to the other side of town, there'll be a parade behind you. But you just have to keep going. Or a firing squad at the or end. A fire- <laughs> <laughs> the end of Turns cliff. out it was a death march. Okay. The <laughs> Los Angeles, please. World's <laughs> sexiest death march. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another edition of Spooky Time Theater. 
I'm your host, Graveyard Craig Davis. Today's story, the man who didn't know enough about sports to carry on a decent conversation at work. Let's join Ted as he pours that morning cup of joe. Morning, Brian. Hey, Ted. You see that game yesterday? Huh? The game. Football game. Oh, uh, no, I, I don't follow football too closely. Really? Yeah, I don't follow sports at all, really. Sorry, Ted, I, I didn't know. Didn't know what? That you were a homosexual. I'm not a homosexual. You just said you don't follow sports. That doesn't make me a homosexual. I think it does, Ted. That's crazy. I have a wife and three kids. Of course you do. To cover up your being a homosexual, 93% of all married men with children only do it to hide being gay. Wait a minute. What about you, Brian? You're 43 years old and you've never had a girlfriend. In fact, you still live with your mother. The fact that I've never had a girlfriend, still live with my mother, and spend my free time in an all-male drinking establishment doesn't make me gay, Ted. Well, you certainly watch a lot of gay porn. You bet I do. Have you seen the muscles on those guys? Many of them would make excellent football players, but they're not being properly scouted. Well, I can't argue that. Say, what about last week when those pretty hobo girls came by the office and said they'd have sex with anyone who brought some canned food down to their hobo village near the railroad tracks? I didn't see you down there that night. Was that last Monday night? I was probably home watching the game. Got me again. Sorry if I'm too heterosexual to be having hot, anonymous, man-on-woman sex. How could I have been so foolish? Ted, being a homosexual like yourself has nothing to do with whether or not you're attracted to members of the same gender. I'm afraid either you saw the game or you didn't. So yesterday I should have been in front of the television instead of fruiting around some lake with my dad. Your dad didn't see the game either? Well, he's blind. I don't want your excuses, Ted. I'm sorry. 83% of all blind guys are only like that so they can have an excuse not to watch the game and cover up the fact that they're a homosexual. You show me a guy having sex with a woman and I'll show you a homosexual. If you'll excuse me a moment, I think I'd better call my wife. You'll be happier when the truth's out. Maybe you're right, Brian. Maybe you're right. And maybe I'll call my blind father as well. Well, you certainly learned something about yourself, didn't you, Ted? (laughs) Next time, the man who defied time and wore a Speedo well into his 70s on Spooky Time Theater. Did you have an obsession, like a weird left field thing that you were really into? Like, not like sports. Not, not like sports. No, that's as a, a kid. mainstream yeah. thing, right? Or uh, as you get older, like old ska. I can't come up with anything. Really? That's that explains so much to me. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> like I love people that have a very specific. I am obsessed with the Twilight couple- Zones of Jack Klugman, oh. but only those. I loved it. Yeah, because yeah. he did like eleven. <laughs> Pip. Come back, Did he Pip. do 11? I no. hate a lot of Twilight Zones. I always... It's away. He's in a place called Vietnam. But I don't know. <laughs> it's so sweaty. I do love watching the Twilight Zones for like, ah, oh, there's Burgess Marin. Yeah, there's, again, yeah there's, and just all the old all, yeah. actors. The man. Night Gallery does not age as well as the Twilight Zone. Oh, it does not. No, and, and it's all, they're all kind of, it's like 70s TV stars. Like, it's all like Burt Convy is the devil. <laughs> you know what I can't get enough of lately is just Hollywood history. And oh, just like I reading love, so Rod Sterling, reading about Rod Sterling being pissed off about Night Gallery and like, oh yeah, all yeah, that shit. hated like, it. Where did you read that? I forgot. There's you a know, great I'll book be, about him called Television's Last Angry Man, which is a really is that? Great book. Oh, I think yeah, I think I heard that. Yeah. No, I do the thing where I'm watching a show and I'm like, oh, I got to IMDb this actor or this writer or whoever it is. I IMDb him. That leads me to something else, and it leads me to a, a Wikipedia, and then a book, and then you know I'm off and running. I read a lot of, <laughs> I read a lot of biographies. I have a, sometimes I have a really hard time getting into a novel because I'm much more interested in the in real life shit. Yeah. I love you. Have you read John Lair, the theater critic, any of his biographies? No. Well, he's amazing. One is called Prick Up Your Ears, the fucking oh, biography okay. of Joe Wharton. Yeah, I was going to say that's about Joe Who killed Wharton. his lover with a hammer. I did not know that. I know that Gary Oldman and then played him in the film. Oh, no. He was killed by his, his lover. lover. Yeah. He was basically a working class kid who became a great playwright. His lover was um, an Oxford guy who didn't 
do any like he watched Orton get super successful and he decided I can't deal with this anymore and just fucking killed him with a hammer at the height of Orton's success. Lair wrote an autobiography, I mean a biography on um on Joe Orton, but his greatest one is called The Cowardly Lion about his dad, Bert Lar. Oh, he's Bert Lar's son. Yes. And just the history of vo- – he's a great writer. And now I'm reading – Oh, my God. I really Now I'm reading the uh, biography of uh, – by John Lair called uh, – it's, uh, it's about Tennessee Williams and it's fucking amazing. It's called The Mad Pilgrimage of the Flesh. And <laughs> just the, all the – I love all the old theater does history. It, does it go into like when Tennessee Williams was out here in Hollywood just drunk off his ass? Um, no, I think that's William Faulkner. That's Faulkner and Fitzgerald – Faulkner was yeah. totally like that. Like, I believe uh, he the hated character. Ho- These guys couldn't deal with Hollywood. I believe the character that John Mahoney plays in Barton Fink is based on William yes, Faulkner. Yes, you were right about yeah. that. That movie. But I love. Uh, unbelievable. I love, in my uh, top five. I wish I could say I was like that in my 20s. In my 20s, I was smoking a lot of grass. I was very much into hockey and girls, not getting them. But I can't think of anything specifically so you like a the two, weird. So you combine the two and went on a lot of dates with Gordy Howe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does masturbating to your dick as a bloody pulp count? No, no, no. I think that's that's, that's <laughs> on universal. Amphetamines? That would be really. <laughs> oh yes, till, amphetamines. Till it's just a pile of shavings. <laughs> It looks like somebody's been whittling a finger. That would be a strange thing of somebody like, I have a big confession about my youth. I don't like to talk about this, but I used to rub my sex organs until I achieved orgasm. (laughs) This was a pilgrim kid who finally... I did this twice. (laughs) I do it at red lights. Hey, has there been a podcast... (laughs) Has there been a podcast, has anyone done this, this must be done by now, where they're like doing it from an age that didn't have like technology, but like, welcome to the Pilgrim Podcast. Oh, that's really funny. I don't know. Would that be funny? And like, just like today, we're going to discuss planting. Well, there's an idea. Anybody who wants to make a (laughs) lot of money. (laughs) (laughs) Ka-ching. Here's a way to make a lot of money. Get a podcast that dot dot dot. <laughs> <laughs> the only person I met that was kind of a weenie was Eddie Murphy. I met him in 1984 or th- no, 1983. Yeah. And he was just it was in the parking lot of the Stop and Shop in Hyannis, Massachusetts. Oh, really? And he was on the Delirious tour oh. and he was performing that night. And I was literally just hanging out, and I was walking around. I said, hey, I'm going to see your show tonight. I'm really excited about it. And he just kind of looked at me and looked away and kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> He's kinda, and my friend was with me. It was a, my friend goes, dick move. My manager, my friend, my friendly <laughs> manager, my managerial <laughs> friend, but he met Tom Petty. Yeah. Oh, I hope he wasn't. Tom went to school out here, and Obi-Wan LaSalle said, <laughs> I saw you play with Elvis Costello in the attractions uh, in 1986 at the Spinning Songbook Tour. And Tom went, no, we never did that. (laughs) And he's like, no, you did. I was there. He's like, I never played with Elvis. And And, you did? And and, and Tom was like, and I was going to go back at him again, and I realized, well, I'm not going to win this, but I know for a fact you were there. (laughs) And there were, like, pictures of the concert in Rolling Stone. (laughs) Now, can you tell me what went on there? Was Petty... Having a brain fart where he literally didn't remember that, or was he being a dick? I, I think it might be a third thing. I don't What's know. The I'm, not, third thing? I'm not Tom Petty, but you, know. you are not. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm out of here. Are you ready for I, a? I are you ready for a bomb? <laughs> I think that that happens to him eight times a day. I see. At least. Yeah. And I think just to keep it interesting, I he'll see. occasionally just go. No, that never happened. Is that why Dylan is doing commercials just to keep it interesting? I think he just yeah he. he I think he's a, one of those guys. He released a Christmas album two years ago. <laughs> Remember that Bob Dylan's <laughs> Christmas from the guys. heart. I think he's like eh, fuck yeah. The great thing that Dylan does, I think, yeah, the minute you become codified as anything great, you destroy it. So Absolutely. you can start fresh again. Absolutely, because you don't want to become like you too, 
where you're the Colossus of Rhodes and <laughs> everything you do has to be marble and, fit, you know, they can't just they make an up. album. Yeah. You have to own it. It gets yeah. immediately put into your computer. It gets or immediately yeah. put. In. That's where they fucked yeah. up, right? I heard about to, that. And you like, need to spend a day I'm listening so, to it. Yeah. Get over your fucking self. Mm-hmm. I mean, I hang out with Bono, but I think they have come. <laughs> yeah. Scratch golfer. <laughs> That's another thing. Like, if you get that guy in a pair of banana yellow pants down at the Beverly Hills Country Club <laughs> and a band lawn shirt. Funny, man. See, that's another thing. I could not have less interest in golf. Me fucking too. Yeah. And I have a lot of friends. I would who rather love well, yeah. it. People I would never think are uh, like, oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. And I still don't understand like how I get it's up even... at 5 a.m. and go to the Los Feliz. I'm like, fuck you. I like to go skiing because. You no, do? I do. Because I'm scared. I can't do it anymore. I'm not a great skier, but I can go. I'm not like a black diamond skier, but I can go down a hill. I only learned a couple of years ago, but oh, wow. no one can bother you. That's true. You mean as you're going down yeah, the hill? You, nobody can talk to you. You yeah. can't text. You can't email. No. It's just you. Sonny and Bono's and last word speaking of Bono. <laughs> by the way, Sonny Bono died by skiing into a tree. I know. And at the Palm Springs Film Festival, they give away the Sonny Bono Vision Award. Do they really? <laughs> if he was, saw the tree. Uh, You've been to the Palm Springs Film Festival, huh? I, I, I had a couple of Google and alerts on that. <laughs> <laughs> I did that on my 12-part documentary on the career of Susan Anton. <laughs> um but I don't like read ski magazine. Yes. Like I don't watch skiing on television. Like yeah. how do you watch? My dad watches golf on television, and this is like you're. I don't know if this qualifies as being alive. <laughs> I agree. When you're watching golf, you're on TV. watching a thing. Now, being an avid sports fan, when there's one of the huge, huge tournaments like the Masters or whatever, I might like look at that for a minute. And it's hilarious to me because yeah. it's basically isn't the, watching people walk in greenery. Well, That's it's also basically like the what Stanley it is. Cup. Like hockey is an exciting game now to watch. Now watch it. Now watch where you're no, going No, I'm coming right out now. in favor of hockey. Actually. Okay. Hockey is an exciting game to watch. Okay. It's Be very fast. careful here. It's fast. It's yeah. violent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You yes. can get really hurt. Yes. And yeah. if you win the Stanley Cup, you get this giant yeah. trophy. Yeah. That you only get for a year, and then you've got to give it away at the end of the year. There's loss in it. There's possession, and then there's loss. It's human. In golf, I think the biggest prize is a lime green sport coat. (laughs) Isn't that true? Like, if you win the Masters, you you get get a green green jacket. An ugly green jacket. That's all you need to know. The way to sponsor golf could be like, if you win, you get to beat to death the romantic partner of the guy who came in second. <laughs> you know, there should be like... Fuzzy what? Zeller's girlfriend is being horribly maimed right now by Fuzzy. Tiger Woods. Fuzzy Zeller. What a great golf name. <laughs> Golfing is a guy thing, yeah. but it's so not a masculine endeavor. Absolutely. Yet, but lesbians love it. They do. This is what I want to know. The percentage of women who golf that are lesbians, I'm going to say exceeds... The percentage of men The percentage who golf of, that of, are heteros- straight. of heterosexual women. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, certainly professionally. Yeah. So there has to be something yeah. about a reduced level of estrogen <laughs> that makes you want to golf. Or maybe it's a love of pants. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what it is But either. there's something. You can't deny that there's something. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know what it is, you know? Softball and bowling. Really? Are there a lot and of... And discus uh, tossing and um, chipping uh, frozen fossils out of ice stone. <laughs> <laughs> ex- ex- the, the, the lesbian domination of exuding woolly mammoths from glaciers has gotten out of control. Yeah, no, it's very... Where's very, the ice pick? I'm, it's I'm very, so, very strange. Yeah. What is it with lesbians and golf? I think you should open that up to your fans. <laughs> If anybody knows, yeah. call us now, 1-800-DANA. 1-800-354-DANA. We're taking calls on lesbians who golf. Cleveland. We're, we're two guys a, smoking huge cigars. Sim- what cigars. the hell is it what? with lesbians, lesbians and, and golf? golf? Now, I understood Sappho in Greece, <laughs> right? Now, everybody understood that. Yeah. 
We've all she seen, was the originator. We've all seen Emmanuel in Bangkok. We know, <laughs> we know what they're like. No, it's very. But like my oldest brother, I, I, I know a lot of guys that are just like they live to golf, and it's funny. I just, but it's the just, guys I know get up at like four thirty, and these are guys who wouldn't get up for shit. What interests me about it is that I <laughs> have zero same here fucking interest in it. But to that end, you went to Hawaii on Halloween, which I look at as like <laughs> you've also tasted human flesh. Like, how would you do that? Yeah, I don't have a great attachment. I, I love that my wife is really, really into it, and she decorates a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's really cool. I like it. I like it aesthetically. Yeah, I agree. For I, sure. That's a big part of it. I like, and you know what I really like? Equated gotten... with a time of year that's beautiful in the East Coast. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, out here when it, when it gets into the low hundreds... <laughs> And you're out in a cornfield with no shade. By the way, have you thought about this shit? Like, I'm getting and you nervous. Feel like, you about... feel like it's you're in Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> like, it will take us four weeks to cross the cornfield. <laughs> Are you getting nervous at all about the drought conditions and the heat? I'm already panicking about next June. Oh, I've got. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, I'm yeah. like, this is. I've got. Fun. Well, every potential catastrophe with me ends in my suicide. So, uh, <laughs> uh, no. I, well, I've got. I've got water. I mean, like, I have. How much water can you have? We go through droughts every three to five years. I mean, it, you know, the Dust Bowl. It doesn't. Yeah. It's not all global warming. There is a sense of uh, natural climate. Right. I just would think know. global warming we would suppo- exacerbate these and, cycles. Yeah. And you the know other what I mean? thing about Los Angeles is yeah. we're not supposed to be here. Yes. You know, all exactly. of our water is trucked in, pumped in. Palm trees, the symbol of L.A. Absolutely. And every palm tree you see down here was, was trucked in. We're not supposed to be here, and there is a shitload of it. This and is the me. main reason people come to L.A., oddly enough, pinks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that line is huge. But does this flip you out too about L.A. lately? I feel like it gets more and more intensely overcrowded. Like every time I hit the road, I'm like, Whoa. Oh, I know. Whoa. It takes an hour to go to the corner. What? <laughs> no, is that me? I'm like, holy shit. I know people who live in Ojai, California, and they commute to L.A. a couple times a week, and it's an hour and a half. It takes me an hour and a half to go to Santa Monica sometimes if you have to. Absolutely. I mean, you might as well. We're looking at junior high schools for my oldest daughter, and I'm just like, <laughs> Well, what about this school? Like, we're not going to commute to Westwood every day. It's an hour and a That's half. That's a big consideration, isn't it? Huge consideration. It's like in the way L.A. is like, what about going to a public school? Or she could go fight for her life down at the junkyard. You know, it's like, Maybe she could just get a baseball bat with a nail in it and fight feral dogs to stay alive. She can't go to a public high school. Honey, how was your day? Pretty good. I would say three dangling rectums. And, a, <laughs> and, and I punctured an eye. Very good, sweetheart. <laughs> Good for you. (laughs) Three dangling rectums and a hi, how do you do? Talking about like having to tone it down, we just watched Ed Wood again at the uh, Writers Guild Theater. That's right. Um, With you. (laughs) (laughs) You barely. You did. With me. Yeah, (laughs) with with you. But I was telling my friends that I went with that Bill Murray actually is toned way down from the real guy. Like Bunny Breckenridge is much bigger yeah. than Bill Murray is in that movie. <laughs> well, I think Bill was actually a little disappointed in a sense. I think he was one of those things where he agreed to, oh, I'll be in a Tim Burton movie. He was really excited mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. And, and it was like, wait a second, I'm play- uh, who am I playing? <laughs> am I playing? <laughs> he was great in that. He yeah, was, he's fantastic. He's, when, fantastic. he's fantastic. When, when Rudolph Gray was writing the book originally, I knew Rudolph Gray back in New okay. York, and he would stop by in my apartment. We'd talk about Tor Johnson. i show him my photos. He said a bunny, uh, Breckenridge, Breckenridge yeah. got on the phone with Rudolph because Rudolph was writing the book. Yeah. He said, why don't you come out to my pool? in Hollywood and what do you look like <laughs> and Rudolph was really nervous and he was telling me this he wants me to come out there and sit at the poolside and stuff and you know should I do it and I said well you, you know you, you're researching this book I think you have to do it mm-hmm. I didn't hear about uh, back after what happened I kind of fell out of touch with Rudolph but you know that was what he had to deal with at that point mm-hmm. but those guys were still around then yeah are any of them still around now yeah. 
Conrad Brooks might still be alive, I but I don't know. He, he might be the last guy. Yeah, I'm right? not sure yeah. he's Is that well. Possible? So. Is Tor Johnson's son alive? Carl, who was a. Oh, wow. I don't know if Carl's around. Because he was in Plan 9. Yeah. You know, but well, technically, Bella Lugosi Jr. is certainly still yes, alive. Right, right. And he will sue you if you he mention will. his name. Your Honor. How do we like this? <laughs> he doesn't Bella, sound Bella, anything. Bella, I know he doesn't. He's just on Gilbert, I heard Bella Lugosi Jr. Was just a on lawyer. Gilbert Godfrey's podcast. <laughs> just on Gilbert Godfrey's podcast. And I listened, and he sounds like a, just a guy from Southern California. Yeah. Right. You don't hear his father at all. Right. He was yeah. completely, you know, it's like a very boring interview. It's like he had nothing to contribute. Whereas Sarah Karloff was terrific. You know, sounded like her dad. A little bit, and, and well, well uh, Mila benefited from the Sarah Karloff lawsuit mm-hmm. in the terms that Bella of, represented, right? Bella right. Jr. Yeah, the yeah, yeah about good. the the uni- when they sued Universal mm-hmm. Lightness. Mm-hmm. Well, Bella Jr. was very, you know, he was very against the movie Ed Wood for a long, long, yeah. long time. Mm-hmm. He since sort of come around. Oh, he did. I, th- I think so. I've, I've heard through the grapevine. That I've he heard him. Like, he talked about Martin Landau right. on, on the Gilbert podcast, how much he loved that. Oh, know, yeah, good. Because you know. he was upset that we had his father cursing. Yeah. Right. He said, well, he didn't own those dogs, you know. Right. He had the, the great to me, that's the, if the, the, a that, minor if that's point. That's we, your problem. If that, if that's <laughs> that was his yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People were upset about the dog thing. It's like he had small dog. We had a small dog in the in the movie as opposed to had a big dog. Right. That's what he picked it's up like, yeah. <laughs> when Myla passed away, Myla Nurmi, I was listed in the LA Times as the contact because I basically mm-hmm. handled their stuff. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize um, obituaries had contact. Well, no, it was, no, it was <laughs> you need to contact. You know, yeah, there was next to Ken. Once everything was paid for, uh-huh. they surfaced to get. The, once I no. paid for everything, mm. this oh, long lost surfaced. cousin uh, surfaced up and said, we like whatever she didn't spend. Nice. But uh, that was kind of them to attend the funeral that I paid for and then turn around <laughs> and accuse me of stealing her uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Which I, is really, I, I, I wish I have regrets I didn't attend certain funerals. Like I didn't go to hers. I wanted to go to Curly Joe Dorita's when he died. Sure. And I heard later there were about five people there. Too I many. went to Vic Mizzy's wow. funeral. Did they play was, the Adams family? Well, it was so funny. We were at the graveside with the family. And we were with Andy Marks, who's uh, sure. Marks' grandson, mm-hmm. and uh, and he knew Vic a little bit. That was our in. I met Vic, uh, and Andy was like, "We should freaking play the, you know, we're here." Yeah. literally, he he because the family was kind of being, you know, a little respectful. Uh, respectful. Yeah. But Andy went and literally like downloaded the Adams Family theme song <laughs> on his thing and played it over the grave uh-huh. as it was going in. It was great. It was actually a very, it was a beautiful moment. And the family loved that. They actually, mm-hmm. they, they, nice, they, they nice. That. I'm yeah. glad he yeah. thought of that. Yeah. It's only appropriate. Right. What happened was when Milo's obituary was printed, the LA people who wanted to get a hold of her called the LA coroner's office. Somehow mm-hmm. I was the contact to the LA coroner's office. And I got on my answer machine. There was this Bunny Breckenridgean class of incredibly flamboyant gay man that lived in Hollywood in the 50s. Right. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's gay guys, and then there was Bunny Breckenridge. Mm. Right. And now it's just Skippy Lowe. No, he's the only one left. Yeah. But I had, like, over the course of a week, five messages from the Dana, <laughs> it's Violet Twilliger calling. And, like, like, every single name was crazier than the one. This is Dandelion Piccolo, and I got your number from Violet. Uh. Well, I think back in those days, if you were out, you had you went, to you, be out. Yeah, you know, yeah, you, were, oh, you, yeah. you embraced it. You were the third sex. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah, exactly. Franklin you know. Pangborn. Was he out? I'm, I, I've um, never heard about his private life, actually. It's I've like, always I don't heard even the, know. Richard Deacon was one of the few guys. Who was uh, was he? Out. Everybody knew yeah. it, but he certainly was never out on screen. Like yeah, he was always a dad. But, I, but I, he, was, he, would, he would openly go yeah. to clubs. Yeah, I've heard he the stories. He was there was a leather. popular yeah, bumper sticker. Yeah. There yeah. was a popular bumper sticker: "Dick Deacon before he dicks you." It was a very <laughs> popular. <laughs> 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 It's, it's funny about these musicians when I think about it. Someone asked me, how do they break in, you know, into the studios? It's the same thing as how you guys as comedians break in. You just sit in. You sit in in clubs. You know what I mean? You yeah. just kind of you get your shit you beat out of you. And sooner or later, someone recognizes you, right? I mean, mm-hmm. And you just yeah. keep going. Yeah, continuing is really the main contributing factor. I, I think it was Woody Allen. It was like showing up as 90%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're just going to keep... Eventually, you get an award for not dying. Yeah, there's so many guys I know that are so funny, it's, and, you know, and they just... They stopped because they the, a couple of speed bumps made them not want to do yeah. comedy yeah. or writing anymore, and it was just it's kind of devastating to think that you know it, it could have easily like one of those times where I'm just like no nah, I don't feel like doing it anymore like oh, it could, yeah. I could have just you know never done it. Well, they, that's what my father was talking about some of the you know some of the greatest guitar players he loves. You know he said the best in the world. He says no one else knows them because either they're doing it at home or they just don't do it out. 
And it's, unless you're going to be out there and trying, I mean, you know, you can't give up. It's luck too. Yeah. But then you start to think of the idea of it's like, so like, but does anyone need to know is just being really proficient at something you love? Shouldn't that be enough? That's our ego. That's the ego. Yeah. You know, I agree. I mean, people always say, oh, you've succeeded. You know, you, you finished the film. Most people don't. It's like, yeah, succeeded. I, I don't know if I, you know, I succeeded, but my concern is I didn't go all the way. And that's why I kept going. I could have quit a long time ago with the awards, but my, my concern was financial. I got to uh-huh. actually sell this thing. Yeah. That's, you know, then I went all the way. If it died in 2008 in film festivals, I would have been upset, but I would have walked away. You know, but you have to keep going. If it was looking at it as a financial thing at some point, even though I did it for the love at first, but then the love turned into, oh my God, what did I just do? Yeah. You know, uh-huh. the ball's already, already rolling. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and you know, you, what you're doing is you have kids. Yeah. In school. And and kids in school. And, and a house. And yeah, I have a house. And it's, uh, uh, and, and it, you know, you just keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. A buddy of mine, I uh, was just talking to him last night because, you know, he just bought a house within the recent years and, he was talking about how he was like producing stuff and kind of just you know going along and making money, but then uh, his wife you know was like he's like you know we should buy a house we should have a kid and he's like uh, he's like yeah yeah well, we can do that right now she's like but if any time you're just gonna stop doing this stuff and pursue just wanting to just be only directing things you would have to start that now and then he did it and he's sustained. So it's That's that good. jump, it's that leaving the miserable job and following that little bit of passion because that little bit of passion is going to fill up, fill in all the cracks of money and, yeah. and like, you know, depression and anxiety. That passion will just kind of glaze over all that stuff as you move forward. Yeah. I mean, we, if you try to do this anything in later life, I don't, you know, you never try to discourage anybody to do anything, but it is harder as well. I'm, I'm 53 now. If I had to do this now, I mean, in my 70s, if I have to finish this project, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so I'm trying to cut it down in half for the next one. No, and it's true. And it, well, it's the reason that I, like, it, even though I'm employed do, writing something, like, like, why do you still do stand-up? It's like, because well, I go crazy if I don't, you know, it's yeah. like, or this, yeah. you know, it's like, you have to have an outlet. And it's, I have to do something that... I can get out that that I can just get out unfettered that it doesn't have to go through a committee and then it's up yeah. to somebody to decide whether or not people see it or not that it's just like no I'm going to do this and then it's done and it's out I'm going to go and perform and people see it yeah and uh, if you don't have that as an artist I think you start to go bananas painters have to have shows that's the truth yeah I said it. <laughs> <laughs> as a comedian and as a musician that's playing live you have instant. Response, yeah. Response, yeah. You know, the only difference is you guys have a lot harder because they could not, they could ignore a musician in a club. Yeah, no, they can ignore comedians. That's what I, 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 that, I that, yeah. that, that, but that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. You're the, the ignoring a comedian is the worst thing that could ever yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you, you know, singer can just turn around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a different type of paying attention. It's you a, know? it's a, the pain is horrible. Yeah. I did a screening uh, a few years ago. Everybody wanted me to do screens. I said, fine, we'll do it. You know, and some guys would come up with some, you know, grandiose ideas. One guy, Joey, and he had a place in Jersey, Joey in La Casa. He had a restaurant, you know, and he said, why don't we do it? And he's an Italian accent. Why don't we do it? You know, and then I said, you know, we'll do a screening. We'll do a movie, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay. Well. And he goes, so Joey's La Casa. So I go out there and, he, you know, big, we're going to, you know, three nights, you know, dinner and a movie we'll pack this place i'm thinking ching 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 <laughs> i get there and it's the first time i felt what comedians and musicians feel like in a bar when the bartender l- doesn't even look at you uh-huh. the waitresses ignore you yeah because yeah. you just killed their weekend and i said oh man no it was horrible yeah it was horrible yeah well that was like you know if you don't want to if you know the only way to avoid stepping in shit like that is to never do anything yeah. You know, so if yeah. you don't want to get criticized, don't do anything. You know, you yeah. don't want to get rejected, don't do anything. It's just we're like, I don't know what it's like in medicine or business of a, you know, like show business is, you know, 87, 90% rejection. Yeah. And it's just like you just have to separate yourself from what you do because it, otherwise it'll just murder you. It just yeah. it, it just murders you. My manager is, has a great. He's like, you know, it's like we're selling pants. 
You got a suitcase. You got, yeah, I got these pants. You don't like these pants? I got these pants. You got, yeah. That's all we're doing. Yeah. We're just out there selling pants. <laughs> but these <laughs> pants are the best pants. They remind yeah. me of my childhood. Exactly. <laughs> you have to buy these pants. Yeah. But they're not selling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like not... them better as shorts. They don't work as shorts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like those pants. Could they be a kiln? What? <laughs> yeah, I'd love those pants if they were a rice steamer. Not to get too heavy and weird, but we seem to have gone into a very existential cul-de-sac mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. F- friend of mine, 84 years old, uh, dies. Mm-hmm. And uh, this person always have lived to fight, lived to nurse a grudge. Right. That was their gig. That kept them alive. Yeah. And then I just realized, like, yeah, all the 15 years I knew you could have been happy. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You, I think you've, you've told me about that before, and the the phrase you used, which is a, a phrase I try to think of all the time, is uh, all those wasted afternoons. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, when you guys would get together and you would just you know, you could have been having conversations about nice things and fun things and yeah. art and you know yeah. movies, but there was complaining going on. You're like all those wasted afternoons, all those wasted afternoons sitting in Musso and Frank's. All right, here's a question about that person. I don't know the person or what he did. Do you think he was like that all his life? Because I find me interviewing all these older folks, and I'm obviously, you know, I started 18 years ago, watched them from early 60s now into the 80s. It concerns me a little, you know, um, about myself. And uh, uh, I see I, a lot uh, of bitterness. There's bitterness uh, in some people, and it's like. The, um, I don't know. They. they uh, uh, I. I th- to a degree, I think to a degree they had a plangent view of the world, but I think that they. Uh, Were they alone? That's, that's, I find, you know, a couple of these people, you know, they're alone or they have, the only thing they have is their computer and that, that's a vent, you know, they vent on those computers. I don't think that people are hardwired to be alone no. for a long period of time. And especially when you get in to your, uh, to your old age yeah. where you, uh, it's, it's a natural inclination to isolate, uh, anyway, like I'm, f- Sounds sexy at first. Sure it does. Yeah, yeah. 80 years old by yourself, just <laughs> yeah, you. and you have your routine. Yeah. Be a Hugh Hefner, never get out of your pajamas. Yeah, that's the only, the only guy that at that age has it, <laughs> you know. But he's doing the same thing he did when he was 38. Yeah. I, th- I, I feel kind of sadness for that guy. He, he reminds me, Hugh Hefner reminds me of the Twilight Zone episode where, you know, it's the last guy in the yeah, world yeah. and he's a, he has all the books the and line, then he right. can't read them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true. Well, you yeah. know, they have this thing called Viagra now. <laughs> I can't imagine, like, what is he? He's in his 80s, right? He's got to be 85. I can't imagine that stuff being good for your heart. I'd imagine it's I still know. working. I'm, I'm, somebody can, I'm going to guess he's still, when he wants to, throws something around would you want to though in your 80s do no, you think you're gonna i don't want to now <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, uh, it's like the when i'm just a perry bit, mason is I, on when i'm a bit cranky i go i could do without it I, sleep sounds just as yeah, good to me yeah, right yeah, now yeah yeah it's a lot of work so we're getting into the holidays what are your big holiday plans you're mm. all about you know i wish nativity I- scenes but with different <laughs> people in them Again, it's my wife, and she really loves – my wife loves Christmas. Like you say, you hate Christmas. I don't hate you Christmas. I don't, I don't hate it. It's just a so massive I get into ass pain. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean buying gifts for everybody, that whole thing? I like buying gifts for people I care about. It's sending yeah. out 400 Christmas cards to yeah, yeah. a guy I sat next to on a plane four years ago. He's <laughs> still on the list. <laughs> The trip – you know, we've got to go on a trip. The kids are out of school. Da, da, da. I would actually love to go back east. Um, There's I have so to many film in Atlanta f- for a bunch of the holidays, which kind of oh really? Well, it, back and forth, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is for your this is an show. Adult Swim show called right. Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell. Right, I have to go there right before Thanksgiving, come back for Thanksgiving, and then film till like mid December. So that's kind of like I'm hoping it'll be cool there. It will be a little cool <laughs> down there. Atlanta's but, nice. I like Atlanta a lot. I like going the down Laughing down. Skull. You can just go hang out at the Laughing Skull when you're down there. Do you? Do you yeah. Go in a lot? yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to do little guest spots. Yeah. I actually really, I was going around doing lots of shows because I was hanging out yeah, there for like three there, yeah. weeks, and they were great. You know? Oh, that's terrific. Yeah, I like Atlanta a lot. My wife's parents are in in Maine, and I like 
Maine, but it's cold. Oh, yeah, Maine's cold gorgeous. Fuck, but but it's great. It's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, it's gorgeous. Up until about, literally, like right after Christmas, and then it's just shit until beginning of April. Then it's just oh, that dark nasty. And sticks. Yeah. Just yeah. dirt and sticks. Here's another thing about LA. Just one last shot at LA. <laughs> and this time of year is that. Well, not one last and, one. And I was in Hawaii when the clocks went back, right? Right. So it's hilarious to me that it's hot as fuck, and then it gets dark really early. Yeah, I so, know. So, like, it's a weird double fuck. <laughs> like during the day when it's supposed to be fall, it's really warm, and then all of a sudden it's dark. Yeah, it's dark. and it's like and it's, it's like a miserable fucking yeah, summer. It's dar- yeah, but it's it's dark. <laughs> like last night, it was dark. And it was 70. Yes. So it wasn't even like, like a pool that's too warm. There's yes. no like, ugh, like a room urine? temperature Is pool. This? Yeah, and you get in and it's like it's not refreshing. It's just like, yeah. ugh. Yeah, so I've been thrown like, like uh, I was telling Jeff that I, I have been just out of it this week after coming back from Maui. Just trying. Like I consider a great day when I vacuum. Yeah. And maybe tweet a couple of things. Sure. And I actually did my podcast. It's like, wow, what a week. <laughs> I've really achieved. Lather, rinse, repeat. I am getting a lot done. Yeah. Thanks for thinking my hair is so fucking filthy, Prell. <laughs> You're going to have to wash twice. You know why they have you do that? You know why they have you repeat? Why? So you'll run out sooner and you'll <laughs> have to buy more. They always get you. They get you like that, Eddie. My dad was like, don't repeat. Don't repeat. You don't repeat. need conditioner. You don't need conditioner, right? Yeah. My yeah. head of hair, I just pathetic. The guys now. that landed at Anzio didn't have shampoo <laughs> and conditioner. Sarge, and we're at a liquid prowl. <laughs> what? We have a lot of shampoo. We have no conditioner left. All right, I'm going to have to call headquarters. The shampooed side of the Bro. Normandy invasion. <laughs> 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 No one hit the beach with clean locks. <laughs> Those guys must have just stunk. Ooh. I'm gonna War s- is hell. The other saying, that one caught on, war is bad hair, never, never really landed like war is hell. I'm going to say something that might be controversial, <laughs> but I think it's true. I think World War II was a lot easier than people say, and the guys that said it was tough are pussies. <laughs> I hope I don't ruffle any feathers out there. But anybody who is in the Marines is a coward. I don't want to ruffle any feathers out there. I hope this isn't controversial. But the Native Americans actually voluntarily surrendered all of their land. And it's just been a huge Mm. grotesquerie of history. The lie that their land was taken from them. Every guy I know. By blue-eyed Satanists. Every guy I know who was shot in the head. Absolute pussy. (laughs) I hope I don't ruffle any feathers. I think everyone will agree with me when I say the bravest thing a man can do is run from a fight (laughs) and let his children handle it for him. I'm going to do what every man has the biological impulse to do, and that is leave my children with a lot of debt. And not get them braces. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, boy. We should talk about that. A lot of anger. Oh, man. Every time I go to the dentist. Uh Yeah. Yeah. Full circle. me. Yeah. Here we are. We started on teeth. We end up at teeth. How do we do that? You know why? Yeah. We both know when we're sick of each other. (laughs) For me, it it was ringing the bell. We (laughs) (laughs) We know how to bring it right back. When it happens within 30 (laughs) seconds, I know there's a problem. As I was friends with Myla, my friend Taylor White, who you might know, was friends with Vic Mizzy and Mm -hmm. sort of cared for Vic at the end of his life. And I remember really distinctly one day driving to work at The Simpsons, talking to Taylor on the phone. And he's like, do you want to come by the store Saturday? I was like, you know what? Believe it or not, I, I have to... You know, I have to take Myla and Ermy to buy a blanket. Or I figured, she, you know, was, she needs to buy light bulbs. 
And he was like, oh, shit, I have to call Vic Mizzy. (laughs) (laughs) I got to ask, was Vampire very dressed as Vampire, like Bella Lugosi was dressed as No, she was uh, Mm. was, uh, uh, cremated at her request. um, But that's one of the things. But the dress is at the Hollywood History Museum in the Max Factor. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. I'll have to go there. I have a spare corset if you want it. Okay. (laughs) Really? All right. It touches a lot of people because I think there's a lot of people who have that relationship that, like you're just saying, where where you you kind of meet your, I wouldn't call them mentors, but you meet the, the older person you kind of respected, and all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, they need they need well, help. I got yeah. that when I did my Jewish comedian books. All of a sudden, a lot of those guys started contacting me, right. like Mickey Freeman from the old Bilko show and Freddie Roman, and Larry Storch actually wrote me a letter. He said, could you put me in the sequel? I mean, these guys needed a boost in their careers because right. uh-huh. for most of them it was kind of over. But right. all of a sudden they were rejuvenated thanks to my books. I never even considered that. But right. it, you know, and then Jerry Lewis called, and he was like thrilled to be in. I don't know if that enhanced his career, but he was delighted to be in the book, and uh, I wasn't expecting that kind of stuff. Well, it's normal, you know. We're sitting here, and right behind us is the book I killed, which is stories of comedians on the road. And the first thing I did when I came in was look to see if I was in it. <laughs> like, no, I'm not. My favorite um, story like that is uh, in our first film, Problem Child. An executive on that movie, uh, you know, came from a questionable background, and we went to a friend's house, and there was a book about the mob on the table, and we looked, and he was, we looked over, and he was looking at the index. So he was like, he was, searching, he was searching for people he knew, and he was like, oh, fuck, he is mob. He is mob. Index checker. Yeah. I, thought I, was, I thought I was the only one. Yeah. But, but a book on the mob, you don't look in the index. You know, so honestly. here's two great things you can do for the holidays, folks. Anyone in your life who is a fan of comic books or reads a newspaper? Ugly Old Men. Ugly Old yeah. Men. The book is entitled... Heroes of the Comics. By Drew Friedman. That's E.I. Right. That's right. It's... Not only fascinating, but it's gorgeous. Your style, your your artistic style, I call it pointillism, but I think it's stippling. No, that, I kind of phased that out right. uh, a couple of decades ago. Now it's just watercolor, just painting. It is know? really. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, everything yeah. is painted, yeah. yeah. The stippling was affecting my eyesight. And I, I had miss to the old it style, but some. It, it was like you know. Yeah, finally, like, yeah. I was never a fan of it necessarily that stuff, but I wanted to stipple Tor Johnson's head. You know, right. I to, like, <laughs> make it beautiful. Yeah. But uh, but the way that you the, your style is incredibly specific. There's, it's still it, de- it's still as detailed as ever. I think. Yeah, it's I all, agree. Well, I all, didn't know the difference. It's so all done that, with brush now. Yeah, you know? yeah, I didn't really notice the difference. So I that yeah. let that answer the question. Thank you. People have to see your work. Uh, people who uh, remember you from Spy or the New York Observer, they've seen your work. They might not know it's you. The book is beautiful and it's highly recommended. And then when you, while you're out, say you're at a, you go to the, you go to one of America's eleven bookstores, you buy the book, yeah. and then if it's after Christmas, you can go see Big Eyes. Go see Big Eyes. It start, opens Christmas Day. Uh, it's Amy Adams, Christoph Waltz, Tim Burton directed it. Very proud of the movie. It took a long time. It took about 11 years to get this movie made, and we're finally there, and uh, it's come out so well. And, and the reviews are all phenomenal. Mm-hmm. So far, so good. We're yeah. very happy. Excellent. And I will be at Uncle Fucker's Chuckle Hutch. <laughs> <laughs> How is Uncle Fucker these days? Uh. Four shows Thursday. <laughs> I guess Oklahoma is a state, huh? Yeah, it sure is. You don't oh. think about it much. <laughs> I don't think no. about Oklahoma at all. I've I, been to Oklahoma once. It's a pretty cool town. Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, <laughs> yeah. 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 The, you know, so funny. Lips. I don't think yeah. banjo museum. Yeah. I don't, there's a banjo museum. Yeah, I went to it. Really? Because there's nothing else. We're to the do. only one there whose front teeth weren't molars. <laughs> my first question was, I was like, "So is uh, C. Martin never come?" They're like, "Yes." Is oh, that wait. the question you always get? Yes. 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 <laughs> they hate you. Yeah, they hated it. How big is the banjo museum? Eleven floors. <laughs> it's a, it's it's a lot. Big. There's a lot of banjos. A lot of different types. There's some beautiful ones too. Yeah, there was like one that was Gorgeous. gold plated. Yeah, it was like silver strings. It was insane. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what's comedy like in Tulsa? I wasn't. Oh, Oklahoma, you're into Oklahoma City. What's uh, comedy like in Oklahoma City? I don't know. I didn't do anything. So here's an interesting thing. You've been working on this movie for 18 years. Yeah. And you've been, the movie was completed in 2008. Eight. And you've been basically pimping it. Yeah. Hard. Yeah. For f- six, six years. years. Yeah. It's coming out in March. Yeah. I did a couple changes, but not much. Right. I mean, Leon Russell's in it now. Uh huh. You know. What do you do then? I, I'm looking into uh, another music film about a kazoo player. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> solo artist. He writes his own material. Uh huh. That's it. 
I, what I really found out about myself is what I enjoyed doing on this thing was marketing of the film for the last six years. I mean, I came up with shit that no one else had ever done. I would, the most thing I'm proud of was the dedications of songs. People said, you know, it's like putting a brick in the building, you know, with their name on it. Right. So I did is... Uh, I bought know, a song in that movie. Yes, you did. Yeah. Yes, you did. Um, I think you did. Yeah, I did. Did you? Mm-hmm. Okay. So the last song was... Um, uh, I bought it for my wife because marriage is forever. Go on. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, sore <laughs> subject. Uh, well, let me spin this the other way. So the, one of the songs that we have in the film was uh, Gary Lewis's Everybody Loves a Clown, and no one picked that. So I thought... Oh, great song. Great song. Uh, so Al Cooper wrote it. He, who, I didn't know that. Yeah, who hated it. And Leah Russell produced it. Who hated it. Son of Jerry Lewis? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they don't, do they, and they don't talk? Uh, no, I don't think so. There's probably good reasons. Yeah. So I had this song, you know, everybody loves a clown. I go, God, I got to get this. So I called a clown school up and I said, listen, I got this song. I'll give it to you for a thousand dollars. Put your name up on the credits, blah, 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 blah. You're in. I'm in there. So that's it. Wow. And it was like, I got a clown school to sponsor the song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like. But not one of the big Ivy League clown schools. It's just like a local the, state clown school. No, it's called <laughs> the name of the school. For the folks out there, it's called the Clown School. That's what they're, they're in Los oh. Angeles. Do you know them? I don't, there? but like uh, it sounds official when you put yes, the, clown the, the Clown School. By the way, uh, uh, and their their quote was their dedication was everybody is a clown. So oh. uh, Clown School on spring break. You go make the movie. I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated magna cum cream pie. Hey, <laughs> it's a 18 clowns going to Daytona in a Mini Cooper. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that was the fun part. I enjoy right. that. And uh, do you know? Do you have another film that you want to make? Um, yeah, you know what? I actually do. It's called Relevance. Uh huh. It's you know relevance. Basic, relevance. If people it, later. I got to go back to people in their later years. But the feeling of people wanting to be relevant. How do you keep young? You know, a lot of these musicians still play. They uh-huh. still play in the clubs. They're in their eighties. It keeps them young. Right. You know, it's like comedians. There's nothing, uh-huh. you know, watching and, you know, older like, Well, comedians. Rickles just like... Doesn't know. go. He just keeps going. I did uh, a Bob Hope special when Bob was in his... I love well, that story. in his 90s. <laughs> and, you know, but Bob was, you know, looked like a, you know, a bag of, bag of taters. And then, uh, but when he went on to perform, it was like his back straightened up and yeah. he, you know, he was just like a different person. Yeah. yeah. Um, 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 Neil Mahoney talks, uh, tells a story about like interviewing Hulk Hogan like years ago and like Hulk's like just kind of, you know, the, he's wow. like getting ready and he's just kind of like, you know, has a drink kind of out of camera shot and he's just like, uh, uh, and he's like, it's like, all right, cool. Uh, so what do you think is going to happen? Blah, blah, blah. He's like, what do you think is going to happen with that? Okay. Three, two, well, here's the thing, like, just snaps That's into so Hogan. Funny. And, and well, like, it's weird you said Hulk Hogan, because he's coming to my house on Saturday. There's a commercial being filmed. No yeah. way. Oh, oh, shut the front thing. door. That's hilarious. Yeah. Shit. So, so your house is, they're shooting, they're using your house. Do you do that a lot? Yeah. I'm trying to you anything. Just, you get money out I'm of that. I'm a whore. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Was that the name of the last thing shot at your house? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. Was that the last one or no? The one before? <laughs> Wait a minute. Just... That's Denny's dad's guitar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was one of my first jobs in the industry. It was work not as a lab coat. It was working as a camera assistant, and I on did adult it movies. on adult movies. And it was because I did it for a sociology project. Uh-huh. I had it was a class. I'm sure D- they were all doing it for a sociology. <laughs> yeah, project. exactly. It was deviant behavior class. And that's what it, are you, you know, serious? Wow. I'm serious. Well, okay, so wait, wait, so I, back up now. You're in school. You're going to I'm school. I'm going to go to Loyola Marymount. Loyola Deviant Marymount. behavior class, sociology behavior class. class. And the project was do a paper on something that may be deviant in your life or around your life that others might not think is deviant. So I had friends that worked in the adult porn industry when they were shooting film, and um, the good old days, <laughs> right. uh, quality. So I got the job as a second assistant, you know, loading cameras, and, and I'd go out there and, you know, I know the crew, you know, because they're friends of mine, uh, but they don't know I'm doing a paper on them. <laughs> and um, Ron Jeremy was in it, of course, and, uh, and a friend of mine who I became friends with was a script supervisor, this guy. And <laughs> That's he, yeah, the job. Yeah, but I got an A on the paper. It was awesome. Nice. Good paper. 
How quickly did you get bored? I'm going to say instantly. Um, yeah, it was like surgery. Yeah. You just, after a while, you know. Yeah. You just got to go Cold whatever. cuts. Yeah. It's, it's weird. It's horrible, you know. Can't but you know what? No one. Out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're into it, don't yeah. do it. There's something about a bounce board that just takes yeah. the magic yeah. out of it. <laughs> yeah. Those were the days, you know, with lots of Coke. You know, you're doing stuff that, you, you know, you're spending money on drugs just to stay up. Right. And you're, you just spent your whole day that you were getting paid because it was 18 hours. I try to explain know? to people doing stand up in the 80s, like the, 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 the money and cocaine. It was like sixty forty. Yeah, wow. in some like in some, it was just like there was that much. It was either money, and I've been I've never done I've actually never done cocaine, but I've been offered that instead of pay. Yeah, like green or white at wow. the end of the week, and it, people just it was just a wow. That's a great. World. That's a great title, green or white. Green or white. Or white yeah. Yeah. Oh, green someone's going to take yeah. that. Yeah, the Celtics yeah. probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're green and white. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it was psychological. You know, oh God, we're gonna have to work eighteen hours today. Or you know, it was bullshit. You know, even on the legit films, you know, there was coke and it was on the grip truck, and they put one of those four by four flags up, you know, on the grip, you know, box, and your, you know, your key grip would say, "All right, go." It's uh, you know, pull out the second drawer, and you go up there, and then there was a line waiting for you. Hmm. Oh, you know, really? And, and that would, how you'd like do an all nighter? Yeah, you know, and that was legit. You know, literally, they could have been legit low budget films. But, uh-huh. you know, there was a, you know, a bump or a bonus, whatever you want to call it. You know, it was a nice thing for, or you all split it, you know. Uh huh. You know, but. The thing is about cocaine, though, is that the biggest side effect of it is just wanting more cocaine. It's, there's no, you're never going to, it's like any drug, I guess, you're never going to get the high again. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like always you do, you do a first line, line and you're like, wow, yeah. crazy, this is great. Why you wouldn't get some more. Yeah. And that's like immediately. Yeah. You just want to do, it's just, it's like a sustaining thing. I'm it's so, so glad it's so behind It's me. like potato chips. Yeah. Yes, Dana. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Don't laugh. He's right. <laughs> I know. It's oh, like, it's like potato chips. It's like me with that Ben and Jerry's Greek frozen yogurt. Just, I'll just take a little nibble. I don't know why I bought this. Oh, yeah. Ha! So yeah. The, basically, Skippy doctor, Super Crunch. <laughs> doctor said less salt and less cocaine. Yeah. That's all. You have high blood pressure. No kidding. Uh, well, yeah. That was the old line like I didn't I stopped doing cocaine because I wanted to own things <laughs> <laughs> that was by uh, I believe Bob Lazarus a comedian in Boston um, well The Wrecking Crew so where can people uh, see it in theaters in March in March it's coming out in theaters and uh, VOD at the same time and then, the uh, ruining crew. The ruining crew. Right. Wrecking crew. Uh, the mess them up boys. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know the worst? It's a big smash <laughs> dang record them up. Yeah. You know what the worst is? I get a magazine called Toe Magazine. Because I'm listed in, for some reason, I'm listed in Wilden Hills as the wrecking crew. Oh. And they think I'm a, oh. they think I'm a junkyard. T O W. So I get toes. <laughs> How did, wait, so I get there's a magazine on. about tow trucks? Oh, yeah. Sexy, too. Mm. Toe? I first thought it was just like, like uh, podiatry, very specific. No, 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 no. No, I get calls at least twice a week. Hey, I'm looking for a 1984 Oldsmobile, blah blah blah. And no, I don't have. I I'm I'm a film. All right, click. (laughs) That's amazing. I'm just more fascinated by the concept of Toe Magazine. Oh, it's very popular. Honey, Toe is running my piece this month. Other podcasts reach for the sky. Dana Gould Hour. Free and worth it. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. Your Honor, I'm not going to stick my dick in a mouthful of fangs. (laughs) 